Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Front Face Lock podcast. I'm your host, Ryan, and with me, as always, is the man, the myth, the legend, the horseshoe champion, Vinny. Thank you. What's going on, guys? Today, we are joined by a very special guest, a childhood friend of mine, somebody who lived three blocks away from me. He is a kid from the neighborhood that my mom said should be the first person I interviewed when we started this show six months ago. He's a former two-time PWS champion, multiple time and multiple promotion, tag team champion, including one-time champion, and uh, what is it, American Championship Entertainment Tag Team with Jay Lethal and Monster Factory cha- Tag Team Champion with, I don't know if I was to say this correct, Falaba? Falaba. 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 The one and only Mario Bacara, or as he says it normally, as I've said it for 40 years, Bacara, but it's Bocara. Bocara. Mario Bocara. <laughs> How are you doing, Mario? I'm good. Thanks for having me on. I pre- We were going to do this a while ago, too, and it was like just never uh, scheduled it out right. And then uh, now we're here, though, so I'm excited to finally do this because, like you said, it's known you from New Milford. Yeah, this is going on 40 years that I found out I was pronouncing your name wrong because I'm American. <laughs> no, that's it. We all, I always, we always said, my family always said Bocara because it was just way easier for people to pronounce. And it's just kind of the English. It's Croatian, too, is pronounced how it's spelled. So that's just, it's every letter has a different, like, certain sound. So no matter how it's put together, that's what they say. So, yeah. but yeah, if you're in Croatia, they'll call you Bokara. Okay. It's crazy. Well, you know, when Ryan first told me about this podcast, he he brought up, he's like, oh, by the way, a guy I grew up with was a, you know, WWE professional wrestler. I'm like, you're just telling me this now? Like, we could have been doing, you know, this a long yeah. time ago, you know? Yeah. Very cool. The, yeah. Uh, How's that going? Like I said to you off the air, the more I dug into your career, the more impressed I was and the more I was like, holy shit, this kid from three blocks away from me that I played Little League with. Actually, I, I want to say I want to say you made it. I, I know you got injured, and we'll get into that. But you know, from our perspective, I'm gonna say like we have this whole thing where it's like if you're a super superstar, you're up here. That's an AJ Styles, right? Uh, Seth Rollins. Oh yeah. I'm gonna put you in the bracket below because of what you have accomplished. And we'll get into well, your injury. I, I appreciate that. But I mean. You fought against or alongside of, and I made a list here, and this is just naming a few, Jay Lethal, Matt McIntosh, Falabala, Falaba, Daniel Bryan, Cody Rhodes, Christopher Daniels, Deuce and Domino, Crowbar, Colt Cabana, Curtis Hawkins, Sammy Callahan, and Kenny fucking Omega, who we both hate. But that's just <laughs> naming a few. That's wow. insane. Yeah. That's, a, that's, an impressive, that's an impressive list. It's definitely, definitely awesome. I, well, you know what, dude, because I really, it's so like, I don't think about that stuff. And which is like, when I actually have to look back and think about it, you're like, okay, wow. Yeah. Like, you know, like you said, it was, I, I, I always just, I always wanted to be a wrestler. That was like the main purpose of it. I mean, of course, everybody wants to go to WWE and WrestleMania and go as high and as far as you can. Everybody dreams about being like the guy, but it's a very, very small, minute group of people that make that and it was always like just hey i just wanted to be a wrestler and at the end of the day after everything it was kind of done it's like i did that so it's like i guess i kind of lived my dream you know in a sense now i just got to find other dreams <laughs> <laughs> i got i got a question real quick because um you know obviously you're from new jersey there's a lot of wrestlers that are from new jersey i feel like wrestlers are either from yeah. canada calgary or Burnham, canada or from new jersey for some reason and maybe yeah. <laughs> a little sprinkled into cleveland ohio but um, other than that, I know that um, it says, you know, you trained in Rawway. Was that the school that uh, Kevin Matthews uh, now runs? I believe he runs now. Correct. Well, it's WrestlePro. Yeah, that yeah. was WrestlePro. Okay. And um, it's the sister sister location, or it's also called Creative Pro New Jersey because it's the sister promotion to uh, Creative Pro New York, Cap New York, whereas MJF, you know, Chris Statlander, Max Caster, yeah. like all those guys came from there. Um, and more Bear Country. Uh, Boulder came from WrestlePro New Jersey. Anthony Bones came from New Jersey WrestlePro. Um, 
a lot of guys are, yeah, doing like you said, it's like they either came from uh, Jersey or, you know, like yeah. Jersey's it's- getting to be the uh, the hot spot. But yeah, I was, I was coaching there um, roughly about like seven years. I was there with uh, Pat Buck was the head trainer, who's the producer now at WWE. Okay. And so um, Pat's still like more involved with the school aspect of it. Kev- Kevin's more involved with the, uh, you know, um, promotion aspect of it too, but. The way I mean, it's just the way everything happened last year again, too. I think everybody in general in the in the industry is just trying to figure out how to move forward with yeah. business and you know just kind of get back to some sense of normalcy. So, but um, yeah, I was coaching for a long time. I coached there for said about seven years. So I loved coaching. Such a great, so so much fun. <laughs> nice. Love watching actually, people I, grow. I actually was at a pizzeria in Old Bridge with my son. Uh, I think two years ago, three years ago. And we're sitting there and I see this guy that's right behind us. And I'm like, that guy looks so familiar to me. And I said to my son, I'm like, do you, I was like, I know this guy. And we actually went to one of the shows down in Spotswood, um, you know, an indie show. I'm like, I know this guy. And wound up being Kevin Matthews was eating pizza. I'm like, and this is when he was on impact. He just went to sign with impact. And yeah. I was like, you're Kevin Matthews. Like, Oh yeah. Hey, what's going on? I was like, how am I running into you who just signed with impact? in a pizzeria randomly in Old Bridge, New Jersey. I'm just thinking like, you know, apparently New Jersey is known for diner diners and professional wrestlers now. So, you know, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah definitely we, love, cool. we love us a good diner. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> River Edge Diner, four o'clock in the morning, just drinking coffee. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> drinking coffee. Yeah. Get some uh, mozzarella cheese fries and gravy. It's a Jersey staple. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you go from the kid in the neighborhood in new milford to getting like how did you get your start what what school did you go to who did you train under well i was it's kind of like a, a mixed little story because it's it's harder because back then there was no like google you know <laughs> and like check out to see what schools are around and stuff like but uh, i did some research and i found monster factory um which was a little bit farther Um, but then I also got connected through, um, Gino Caruso with ECPW, Sean Butler and Pete Costello. We worked together at the formal wear tuxedo place in the mall. Okay. And I think Butler's girlfriend knew a guy that wrestled. She's like, and they always, they knew I loved wrestling and they were like, Hey, a buddy of mine is a wrestler. And he's like, you know, your height, your size. And I was like, get the fuck out. You know, I'm like, Ooh, I can curse. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. Of course. Yeah. That's all we so, do. That's all we do. Drink <laughs> so, and curse. Yeah. So, all right. I was like, yeah. So, I was like, get the fuck out. No way. And um, it's just like, yeah. So, he came by the store one day. He, he's like, uh, gave me a business card. And, you know, he's like, I got in the car. Just come out with me. And his bag was there. And he had boots in his trunk. And I saw his That was the first time I'd ever seen, like, a pair of boots up close. And I was like, that's awesome. And then he gave me the card. And I checked it out. And I started in February of 2000. Uh, with Gino Caruso at ECPW in Lake Hiawatha, New Jersey. Oh, wow. I started out up there. But um, yeah, I always was just look. I always wanted to try it. I always wanted to do it for the longest time. I said I was going to do it. So that was why, too, like in high school, I did. I don't know if you remember, I did like all the school plays. I was in the drama club. I didn't go to New Milford High did, School. I moved like in the middle of high school. Did you? Re- you did. Right? Then, I was, okay. I, I was in middle to... school with with you. You were about, uh, I think you were a year older than me. You graduated in 98, right? Right. Yeah, I graduated right. in 99, but I moved from New Milford in 97, and I actually never went to uh, New Milford High School. Oh, shit, really? Yeah, he went, he, wow. went to, he went to PC where I met him. That's where I met and, him in 96. Uh, Bram's Catholic? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't know you went to Bram's Catholic. Holy For shit. one year, and I was asked to leave. Yeah. <laughs> it was a actually a podcast for a different time right yeah <laughs> i smacked somebody with a glass bottle on Vinny's orders i believe it was um yeah it wasn't my order. i was like i bet i bet you ten dollars you won't go and hit him on the head with that fuck no if, if, it was, if it was me i'd go over there and hit him in the head with that fucking bottle <laughs> yeah and i did it and they, because well, my brother Sean was a senior they said you can finish the year out but you can't come back next year <laughs> he pretty much he pretty much was like walking past the kid and it looked like he was gonna throw it in the garbage and he like stopped and you're like oh no and he turns and he had an ocean spray bottle I remember like it was yesterday had the cap on so tight that when he hit it it made Bung! 
and it bounced off the kid's head, didn't even break. And the kid finished eating his apple, was like, oh, and I was like, holy shit, dude. <laughs> yeah, and Vinny was like eating an apple, like, oh, shit. <laughs> 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 but yeah i'm oh, sorry man. we interrupted you we're doing the plays and everything i'm sorry <laughs> oh no yeah I, I said i totally didn't even realize that you were it was so i dude i can't even remember most of high school anyway now <laughs> um but yeah i did i did whatever i could because i knew i wanted to try it and do it as soon as i got out all the places were like gotta be 18 gotta be 18 so it's like i was always one of the younger kids in the grade like i graduated i was still 17 yeah me too and, um yeah so it was like so I did it when I, that was when I started looking at it was when I was 18 then. So up until then, I was like, well, if I amateur wrestle, that's going to help. And if I get involved with, you know, being on stage and acting and getting comfortable, that's going to help. So yeah. I always like, and I love, I, fo- I just like sports, but football was always like my, my big thing. But I did all that just to get kind of ready for when I decided to finally go wrestle in February 2000. There it was. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, quick question: Do you play? Did you play football for New Milford High School at all? Yeah, yeah. I played for Beckton, so he probably oh, Beckton Regional. Yeah, so we probably played each other. I remember playing you guys on, in New Milford a couple times. Yeah, we. Yeah, I remember Beckton. Was that? That was the. Do you guys wow. have the Wildcats? State, were you? But your um, your field. It was down by Route Seventeen, uh, all the way down south, right by Rutherford. Yeah, that's right shitty. by Giant Stadium. Yep, that shitty as yes. dirt. Dirt field. Yeah. Yeah. Dirt all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys know each other. It's a, it's well, like you guys have been find them because he would have been the ju- he would have been a junior when I was playing uh I was a sophomore uh when I went back to Beckton and uh I played football yeah. for three years. So oh yeah, we, we would definitely yeah, we definitely would have mixed it up at some point. Yeah, that's crazy. Small world. So you go seriously, to, it's crazy. So you go to the Monster Factory from, and you you know you win all these titles with uh, Fa- Falaba. I, I know I'm probably fucking his name up, um, and he's a current <laughs> Impact star at this moment. Uh, he was actually just on uh, Impact, I think, the other day. But how do you go from the Monster Factory to getting signed to OVP uh, W? Um. Oh, what the imp- means the impact? No, no, because uh, you were saw, you you went to the development league in WWE. I know you were on Sunday Night Heat. And- oh, I went down. Yeah. Oh, so this was right. So this was a lot of people always thought that I got. I, I didn't actually get signed by WWE in uh, 2005. Uh, I had gone to some tryout camps for OVW like a year and year ago before that, and um, you know they'd invite you down if you did good. They would. Uh, you know, and put you in the intermediate class, which was with Rip Rogers, and you passed the beginner's class. Um, so I went down a couple times. First time I wasn't really, they were like, you got some good tools, but, you know, I think you need to work on, you know, body, this, that, a lot of things. I came back a year later and they're like, well, you got better at everything that we told you to get better at. Your body still sucks. But, you know, I'm like, well, I'm five foot nine. You know what I mean? I'm like 190 pounds, you know, like I'm not, you know, I, I'm athletic, but I'm not, I don't look like, you know, anybody there. So it's like, um, so eventually I ended up getting Tommy Dreamer was involved with talent relations and they were, uh, a lot of guys were getting called to do some extra work and they called, they needed a guy I was available and they brought us in to be like a bump guy for a guy that they wanted to take a look at. So we get to their, their tracks location and, we're waiting there and the limo pulls up and out, out comes the great colleague. <laughs> and we were like, well, he's got a fucking job. Don't you think? You know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, we, so uh, we, we went inside and he proceeded to eventually throw us around and um, he gorilla pressed me, dude, right over his head. Like just nothing like that. Yeah. <laughs> like, and he was just standing there and Shane McMahon had come in and Vince came in at one point. So that we were all like, you know, our minds were blown, but Shane was like super cool. He stayed and he was just like very easy to talk to. And uh, so he was telling Kali what to do with us. And he had me up here and he's just looking at him. He's just thinking, and I'm up here just like, just waiting, <laughs> still waiting. You know what I mean? Like, and he's like, uh, just take a step forward. He goes and just let him go. So he does it. And it's like, dude, I've never like fallen so far <laughs> to where like 
you you heard like the wind in yeah. your ear, and then when you hit, it was like, oh, dude, like you know. So I, like, it was just really. He's like, how was that? <laughs> Shane goes, how was that? And I was like, dude, it's high, man. <laughs> it's gonna be like a really one, high, eleven <laughs> feet. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and after that, like, we did a, another extra work. We went to the tape, taping that night, and we did like I did like a pull apart with Cena and Jericho. And then they were talking to us about other stuff too. And um, eventually uh, we went back down and that was when I did Sunday night heat. When you were talking, I wrestled Rob Conway. I got a phone call um, from Mrs. Quinn and she's like, Mario's <laughs> on Sunday night. Heat. you got to turn this on. And like, I remember like me and my brother and my mom, we all turned it on. We're like, Oh my God, that's Mario. <laughs> yeah. It was like, I didn't even, I, Sergeant Slaughter had come to an ECPW show. I did a cage match with Andrew Anderson and he thought it was really, really good. And when I saw him backstage, he goes, Oh, I remember you from cage match. Cause that was really good. I was like, thanks. It's like, no, seriously. He goes, that was good. So no, seriously. Thanks. And he's like, you want to work Rob Conway tonight on heat? I was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like, next thing I know I'm wrestling and it's like, I get in the ring and I see like Andy Kleber in, in a, like sixth row. And he's looking at me like, Dude, what the fuck? Andy Cleaver, somebody and we like, grew dude, up with, know. by the way. I have way. no idea. I have no That's idea true. how I got here. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what I'm doing here either. <laughs> I, was, like, I, you know, like, and um, then they were they were offering. Uh, eventually, that you know, the match was good, and they were uh, talking to Laura Nitus, and they were offering me a, a position as a referee, and I had never, you know, thought about being a ref. I always wanted to wrestle, and. Um, they were just like, well, we'll bring you to SmackDown the next day and try it, try out. I was like, all right. And I get there and then I see Nova, who was Simon Dean. Okay. Yeah. Simon Dean. And he's like, hey, he's like, did I ever wrestle you? And I was like, no. He's like, cool. He's like, we're going to wrestle on Velocity. I was like, cool. And uh, trying to see Lauren Nice because he wanted me to try raffin, you know, and he, I was going to wrestle and it's getting closer. So I'm like, I'm getting changed. Finally, I see him, and he's like, oh, you're wrestling? And I was like, yeah, uh, they – and he's like, okay. <laughs> I was like, okay, what? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Did I just, like, shit the bed? You know what I mean? And um, uh, eventually, I was, like, talking to Dreamer, and I said – everybody's like, if you didn't say yes, like, on the spot, then you say no. You know? So it's like, they have your number. They'll let you know. But, but I was already going to OVW anyway. I was already planned on moving in September, and all this was going on. And they knew, they eventually they knew that too. And they were like, oh, well, if you're already moving, just move and we'll keep an eye on you. So it's like, you know, I don't blame them. I get it. But so, so, so yeah, you, I went down on my, I didn't get signed. I went down on my own dime. Do you think you, you fucked up your career because you didn't ref and you wrestled? There, there are moments where I realized that I would have lived a different life if I did referee. Yeah. I don't know what, how it would have turned out or what would have happened, but I, there's a lot of times where I go back and I'm like, mm, you know, I probably could, you know, life would have been way different. But at the same time, this, you know, whole character thing with Croatia and everything that happened, like that would have never happened, mm -hmm. you know? So I can't, you can't go back and look at it and think, but there are times where I've questioned it. <laughs> So you you go to OVW and you wrestle a couple matches and and I'm going off of you know what I could find online, um, and then it says you leave and you you go to PWS. So uh, what happened that you left OVW and went to PWS, or if you went somewhere else in between that I couldn't find? Yeah, I went. So I went from OVW eventually. When I came back, I went to Ace, okay, uh, American Championship Entertainment. Um, but I had, I had been rest practicing all, all like all week, and then I was coaching the beginners class actually in OVW for a while. There, the last few months, um, people got called up, and Rip always had like one of the more experienced guys coaching. He asked me if I wanted to do it, and I was like, yeah. So I thought I thought it was like a big, you know, it's like a badge of honor to do it. So, uh, um, so I was there, and eventually um, my ACL went. I tore my ACL like pretty bad. And I was waitering or working in a restaurant. And then I just like was going to get a job like doing security at night somewhere. And um, I was down there with somebody too. Uh, a girlfriend of mine came down. We, was, we were, you know, a long-term relationship. But 
that was like you have somebody else there too that you know is involved in your decisions and all that so uh i was like i have no chance i can't work i can't get paid so i, I went back home to heal up and uh, never ended up getting to come back because family issues and things happened but Eventually, though, I came back and healed up and I started working again. I worked with um, Ace and Mike Morgan, American Championship Entertainment. Um, and then I stayed there for a, a good amount of time. I had, oh, sorry. oh, what happened? <laughs> I lost you. Sorry. <laughs> um, oh, boy. Uh, I was working with Ace and um, Jersey All Pro Wrestling. I was doing um, some work with them too as well. And um, a couple of, you know, I had some nagging injuries and stuff. And then eventually um, PWS came around. Well, I had a, I actually had a, an accident at work. I'm sorry. I hate to like, I'm sorry if I'm jumping around. No, don't worry about it. We're not professional. But, um, I told you this. We're drunk and stupid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you should, if you listen to us, we are the – ADHD podcast of the world. We're all over. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because I'm like, there's so many things that I forgot and remembered because I'm like, I'm trying to. Think, I'm gonna get you know? by the end of this interview. You're gonna be dying to get back in the ring. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, that's good because I'm, I'm itching <laughs> a little bit. So, um, so when I I did come back, I healed up. I wrestled again. Eventually, um, I got hurt at a job working. I fell off a ladder. I was drilling a four inch hole through concrete. I was on like my fourth hole for the day and I hit rebar and the Bosch drill like turned, turned and I ended up hitting the beams in the ceiling and I fell off a ladder. Um, eventually, like a week and a half later, I was losing grip strength. Like I couldn't close uh, my, I couldn't keep a drill going for any more than two seconds and my hand would just open up and let go. So I was getting a lot of nerve damage and stuff from my, I'd wake up in the middle of the night, both my arms, pins and needles on fire, like I couldn't mm. move them. Like every hour and a half, two hours, I'd wake up like that. And it felt like I had a, a helmet on with like a bowling ball on all the time. That's like what it felt like. So eventually I ended up getting um, like, like five epidural procedures. Like they had to put you out and, you know, shoot you up in the neck and stuff. Um, I was out for like a year and a half. And then I started to come back and I was working with Jersey All Pro a little bit. And I saw you know, Pat Buck and at an A show and he was talking about opening up the school. And, you know, I had talked, seen PWS and I'd gone to some shows and, you know, I knew Kevin and it was just like, you know, when I was at one of the shows in Rahway, I was like, I could, I could do this here. Like, I know I can do something here. I can be valuable or, you know, contribute. And went down to the school and talked to Pat and I knew Pat from OBW and, you know, I've known Pat since I started wrestling, Pat Buck. And um, from there, everything just started rolling and working with PWS. And that's when I started doing like that, that character shift. And that's when I did the Croatian part of, well, of the character. You had but, the most sexting character. Now, I, yes. I, and I looked it up and in the most sexting character, you, you used to come out to Pearl Jam, which was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, and, and then eventually it, it transformed into the fedoras and the ties and the champagne and the women, yeah. and uh, you had a yeah. tag team partner, I believe. I don't know. I don't remember who it was. But how did? Yeah, you, Joe Hardway. How did you get into that most sexing character? What did, what started that? Uh, when I, I first started wrestling, they um, Mo was always like a nickname in high school. Somehow came about, and everybody was calling me Mo. And um, well, they took the first letter of my name and the last letter and they shortened it. Everybody was drinking and they're like, oh, you're Mo. It's like, all right. So after that, I was Mo. So when I was wrestling, you know, they were trying to figure out names and stuff. And like, who do you like? Like, Shawn Michaels. And they're like, all right. And then they, everybody knew my nickname was Mo. And they were putting different things together, like, you know, sexy this, but that. And then they're like, Mo sexy. And I was like, they're like, yes. And I was like, no. <laughs> and they're like, yes. And I'm like, no, we're no. You know, and they're like, dude, that's it. They're like, that's it. And I'm like, I can't do anything about this. And it's like, nope. They're like, that's it. And I'm like, fuck. So <laughs> it's like, eventually I was like, just, the, I, I, you know, I, I, that's a gimmick name. And I was so, so not a gimmick. I was just like young white me baby face, you know, like, 
So I was doing that. So eventually after a little while, I, ch I changed it to Sexton just because it sounded the same, yeah. but it was a regular name. So when I came out to the ring, nobody was looking for a character. They were just looking at, okay, this guy is an athlete, whatever, you know, like they were, just, it was a different mindset. But that's how Sexton came around. Um, and then I used to bounce at the harem over on 17. Oh, I love harem. <laughs> we went to that place multiple times. Yeah, we've uh -huh. all, I think we've been thrown out of that place multiple hey, times. Real quick, I real might quick. have thrown one of you out. No. <laughs> there, was, there, was the, there was the old guy that took our money, and he, he pretty much said to us, <laughs> do whatever you want. Just don't get caught or something. <laughs> yeah. Big Dijon. I know exactly who you're talking about, yeah, too. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> so I was working there. And um, so since you all know the atmosphere there, um, I, eventually I was at Jersey All Pro. And they were like, you know, me and Joe were at Ace. And they wanted to bring us in and do something. And uh, Guy Pierre says, hey, I'm going to put you in a tag team. And we're going to call you the Southside Players Club. And we're gonna come out with women and stuff, and it's gonna be great. And I'm like, he's like, we're gonna do it like next show, or the other show. I'm like, all right, cool, this is awesome. Like, we thought this is great. So I talked to Dan Moff, and he goes, hey, let me tell you something. He goes, unless you show up with girls and this and that, he goes, you ain't gonna get girls and this and that, because <laughs> he's not gonna have it. He's like, so if you want to do this and you want to do it right, he's like, you better do it yourself. So I ended up putting this. Uh, outfits together and we got all that shit we'd like me and joe kind of designed it up and um i took <laughs> i bought a, a cheap ass pink stripper pole from like the adult store and <laughs> i drilled to it arrow? to my fucking coffee table <laughs> it was a pink yeah, yeah no, i think it was, it was the one flimsy <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i drilled it to my coffee table it was a cheap ikea little white table <laughs> and it was a mini little stage and a pole so we had that as the entrance. I got black lights. I hung them up over the entranceway. And when we came, and I got two girls from the club to come with me. And dude, it was like, that's awesome. It's crazy. Eventually, it became all entrance. You know, like that was yeah. the whole point. <laughs> yeah, because like, that's how the girls came about. Because if you look up like your the early Moses and stuff, it's you know you're wrestling in Hasbro Heights at the VFW, and you're coming yeah. out to even flow. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, you look further into Mo Sexton and it's like coming out fedoras and champagne and these beautiful women. And it's like, how the fuck did you go from coming out to even flow to this? And that's a great story. I did not know you for anybody who's listening. The harem in Bergen County is a uh, go go bar? gentleman's club. Gentlemen's club. club. I guess you could say Holy it's, right. dude. it's a it's a it's a, a, B, a BYOB. Uh, full nude. Yep. Club. And it's right yeah. next to the uh, <laughs> Satin Dolls, which is uh, Bada Bings from The Sopranos. It, it, it's the original it's about a half a block yeah. away, but it's hidden in this little strip mall underneath this trestle between Route 17 and Route 40. I think it's Route 46. Route 80, I think. Yeah. Or Route 80, yeah. Right and by it, 80 and set 40, it, yeah. You wouldn't even know. I actually worked at Bada Bing a night or two. I worked there a night or two to help out. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, that's it. Was crazy, man. That's how. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a, how all the a character for sure. So how? And that was like that. That's what they wanted. That's what they wanted. So I'm like, all right. Well, that's what we're gonna be there. And I was still doing whatever I wanted on the other promotions. Just my old, you know, my old stuff. You know, my workhorse type. You know. So where did the switch come that you went from Mo Sexton and saying I'm gonna embrace my Croatian? Now I always thought you were Italian, like Bacara. Like I was right. Like, yeah. But how did you make that switch to, um, all right, I'm going to embrace my uh, in Croatian heritage. I'm just going to be Mario Bokora. Um, well, I had gone to Croatia with my father and my sister in, I think it was like 2011, I think, or 12. It was somewhere right around there. Um, and when I was there for a couple of weeks, it was like, I was really, I was, I was out still with the neck injury. I was still out with the neck injury and I was like, man, I should, this is like just an untapped, like we have no Croatian guys. You know, everybody was an Italian or, or, you know, Spanish or, you know, Iron Sheik was Arabic. It's like everybody, your, your nationality was your gimmick. And it was like, I'm like, we don't have a Croatian guy like Merck or like Frokop UFC, you know? Yeah. Um, 
Stipe now is UFC now. You know, he, he's a newer, <laughs> the newer Croatian guy. And then we had a couple guys in basketball, like Tony Kukoc, you know, yeah. Drazen Petrovic, you know, like a couple people that we knew. Tennis player, uh, I think Ivan Isovic. So we always had like a couple of things, but it was very big because my family was so big with, you know, the Croatian heritage. So my father was born there. He came here when he was in his 20s. So and he still sounds like he's fresh off the boat. So that's where the character voice came from. It was an imitation literally of my father. That's how like the character voice came. Because when I was there, too, I was speaking like broken English to my family because I couldn't speak Croatian. And they, they knew English. But like my sister, they're like, yo, she speaks too fast. She talked too fast. <laughs> like, you are good. You are good to talk with. It's like, I'm like, yes, I know. You know, like, so, and it's just basically doing it, you know, so it was easier to talk with them. And then I'm like, yo, this is like, so I can totally do this. And then my cousin showed me this uh, song by uh, Thompson. And that was like part of the whole character too. It was like, I heard this song and I'm like, I just pictured an entrance in this whole thing. And I'm like, dude, this is like, Perfect. But then I'm like, I'm like, how do I do this now? <laughs> how do I go back and, you know, like all of a sudden I'm Croatian now. So that was where it all like more of the inspiration came from was when I was there and I started picking up some words and all. I bought a flag off the street because I was like, you know, I bought a bunch of stuff. So originally I, I ended up trying a different character and different promotion. It was um, D2W in Wharton, New Jersey for Jersey Devil. He had a promotion in Wharton. And um, a lot of guys were going there from the school. And I was like, perfect. I can go try it out somewhere where nobody knows me. So I got like, my dad's a big soccer player and soccer's big with Croatia, you know, World Cup and everything. So that whole character was basically like a soccer player. So I started out as a soccer player and I did like two or three matches and some of the students were there. And the first one I did, they, they ended up going back and they talked to Pat and they were like, dude, that Croatian thing is the best thing he does. It's like the best thing. <laughs> So they showed Pat, like Pat sees the video of it and he's like, would you do it here? And I'm like, well, I'm just going to come out and be Croatian now. And they're like, yeah, why not? And I'm like, OK, like, I mean, if you're cool with it. But he's like, but what if we take it and we turn it instead of being like a soccer player? He's like, you're more of like a shooter, like a Taz Kurt Angle type of, ben, you know, like a, you know, because Santino Morelli in OVW was Boris Alexia. He was a shooter. He was like armbar. That's where the armbar even came from. My whole, like part of the finisher was basically kind of like an idea that came off from Santino Morella, who was doing it in OVW. And I want to get into that, the the armbar thing, because that's something that another question I have, because that armbar, you almost tapped Kenny Omega out with that, but I want to get to that. Okay. (laughs) In this one match that I watched today, because you're, a, I mean, a phenomenal technical wrestler. If you watch some of your matches, like you're phenomenal. And thank you, I appreciate that, dude. I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, <laughs> but no, I've already said, but, um, but yeah, that's where the, so the the character part came, and then so we put our own twist on it, and it started kind of evolving as we were going. And PWS was kind of like um, Eric Pleska was another other partner of it. And he was also like, loved ECW and the, the whole feeling of it and the, you know, the mixture of the guys and everything. So that's what he was like. You're kind of like, in my view, as like the Taz of PWS, you know, and he had other guys that like Macintosh was kind of like the Van Dam, uh, you know, like, so he had his certain people that he had kind of put in, and you know, him and Pat working together on stuff and it was crazy. They put me on like an undefeated streak and put the title on me and it's like, I was like, I, I, I'm like, I'm five foot nine, you know, like, and it was like, they were making this whole big thing about it. And it's like, it's just about the presentation and the character and the whole intensity. I always said intensity goes so far. Like that, like Daniel Bryan's whole shit yep. is intensity, yep. man. And that's, uh, that's so another Steve thing. Austin, I'm, dude. Vinny, I'm sorry. You know? to go, that's a, that's another person I would like to no. get into at some point, but Vinny, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, it's, um, I was just going to say, like you're saying between Daniel Bryan know AJ Styles they're not big guys mm-hmm. they've made it to where you're rooting for them in every match just because of how intense they are and how you could see you know um, with you as well how smaller guys kind of take their craft more seriously to me rather than bigger guys who just have that advantage right off the bat like I feel like the smaller guys have to work harder 
you know, and, yeah. and, and put a lot more time, a lot more effort into it. So I wanted to say when you get the, the nod from uh, uh, PWS about you're going to get the title, what is that moment like when you find that out? Um, they we did like a, similar to like a Money in the Bank rumble, and it was like an on the spot medallion, and so it was like I kind of knew already from going there that I, you know when they told me I was winning that it was like okay well you're probably gonna <laughs> you're right. probably gonna cash it in at some point so it was like um, but it, we ended up cashing it in it was like it was before it was it was the year before WrestleMania where Rollins cashed in in a triple threat. Okay, yeah. And because that had never been done. And Pat was like, it's never been done. So that was li literally how we cashed it in. It was Kevin Matthews against Bonesaw, who was uh, the Spider Man Bonesaw, Macho Man. That yeah, was yeah. his, like, yeah. Uh, yeah. That was his character. Um, he was the champion at the time and he was undefeated and he was wrestling Kevin. So they had like this massive, crazy finisher match. And uh, I came out right in the middle of the match and I handed the referee the medallion and I cashed it in. And they're like, now it's triple threat. And I ended up um, tapping out Kevin in the arm bar. You know, we did a couple of quick things and I tapped out Kevin in the arm bar. So the champion never lost. And now I'm like, here we go. You know, we're off to the races. And it was like, um, it was just, it meant, it meant the lot because it was, you know, I don't think, I think wherever you work, you want to be, like I said, if you don't want to be the top guy, it's like, what do you, what do you, do? What do you, right. yeah, you know, everybody should have that mindset. You want to be, you know, work the best and be in, you know, be in the best spots. But, um, I always just tried to take it as, you know, do the best I can with it. And uh, it does mean a lot to me because it's, you know, they label, you know, usually when people check out a promotion, it's like, all right, who's their champion? Oh, stop knocking your phone over. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but that's like the first thing you look at is who's the top guy, you know, who's the champion. So it's like you represent them, you know, and um, we had a, it was, it was great. I love PWS. I really did. It was like a time. I don't think I, we're going to, I'm going to replicate. I really don't. <laughs> and you were two-time PWS champion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did a. We did an undefeated streak for the for the year, and it was I got to work with guys like Abyss, uh, Luke Hawks. Did a, a wrestle with Cole Cabana there, um, and we ended up. That's where Fala Boss started becoming um, more of the sumo character as well. He had transitioned his 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 character was more of like an Umaga, and he eventually transitioned into like a more like a Yokozuna type character and um he had the medallion so it was like we ended up it was great because i ended up bonesaw was undefeated so after i cashed in the title we had a, a a match i was the heel and he was the baby face but i was walking in as champion in our in our main super card like wrestlemania type show and i was getting cheered and he was getting booed so it was like weird because i'm the heel and i'm the champion but i'm getting the cheers now so we were yes you know i eventually um I ended up tapping them out and place popped. So it was like, oh. after that, we were kind of like, I was kind of like in the middle there, just depended on who I was working with. Cause I next, I wrestled abyss and there's no way you're going to be the heel no. and, uh, <laughs> and, and give heat. Cause you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I, so that was like really? one of the first times I've gigged and you know, I need, I need to ask this question. Cause I've been watching a lot of uh, old TNA on Pluto and you brought up abyss when he does, I think it's like, uh, the black hole move. I, it kind of reminds black me of a yeah, yeah. How bad does that shit hurt? Because he's not. He doesn't look like he's he's soft with that. He looks like he's trying to put you through the mat. Honestly, man, he's like incredible. Like yeah. he really, yeah. Like he's so just good. Like yeah. I mean, honestly, it's it, it's still you're high and it's fast and it's impactful and you're like, yeah. damn. You know what I mean? Like it's not. You don't brush it off lightly, but he has zero uh, intent to hurt anybody. Like, right. You know, I, I mean, he will. I, he was never. Yeah. He would I never. mean, I was. I, I was looking at. You know, Corbin does the the similar move, and then I look at Abyss doing it from, you know, back in the day, and I'm like, Abyss Abyss doing it looks a billion times worse than Corbin. Yeah. Does. And I thought Corbin doing it was bad, but you know. Yeah. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah, I, I love taking that move, but I like it if it's closer toward the end, you know? Yes. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I, it was always like, it's great, you know? Like, But um, yeah, so then eventually I got to the, the December and we did a rematch with Bonesaw and uh, we ended up doing a finish where, the, uh, you know, he ended up 
rolling me up and holding holding the ropes one two three and it was like so there went my undefeated streak i had this like year and a half long undefeated wow. streak and it got and it got it got um taken with a roll up holding the ropes so i we thought i thought it was great you know like i was just like it was great and then um he hits me with a chair Fala comes in and Fala cashes in the title on bone <laughs> on bone so i takes it up from him. so it was great and then um then we went to like I don't know if you guys heard about them or saw them or if they're anywhere, but we did two hardcore street fights in Rahway for PWS. I looked them up. I didn't get a chance to watch them, but I saw that, you know, I, they were, they're on YouTube. And it, check, please check there's them out. pieces. Yeah, there's pieces of stuff on there. Um, so we ended up doing a rematch, and then um, Dan Moff was, came in and became the next contender. Uh, he had, he had the, uh, the other... They redid the medallion, you know, since it was cashed in, and he cashed it in like the next, the next show because Fala had it for a long time. Fala kept it for a while because I, you know, I had they just put a title on me. It was like, you know, they want to build it. It was great. It was so much fun. Um, and we did these uh, triple threat hardcore matches with me, Dan Moff, and Fala. And um, dude, like Balls Mahoney, God rest his soul. He was so fun to be around when he was there. Uh, and he was, he's like done a lot of hardcore matches, you know, like, so we'd even talk to him about certain stuff and spots and he came up to us after that match and he goes, guys, he goes, that's one of the greatest hardcore matches I've ever seen. Wow. He goes storytelling and everything from top to bottom. He goes, you've never lost them for a second. He goes, you had them with everything. He goes, you guys are, he goes, that was fucking, he's like, that was the shit. You got the blessing from one of the gods of ECW. And we were like, dude, thank you. know, like, it's it just, and it's it just because me and Follower in the match, we weren't supposed to have any idea that Moff was going to come out. So as he came out, we just, the way things worked out, he was the one that pulled out all these weapons because we shouldn't, we shouldn't be pulling things out because we have no idea what, we have no idea. Moff was supposed to do like this Moff rules match. So he had all this shit there and his opponent didn't show up. So his match became our match and it was great. <laughs> So we just built it to where it had thumbtacks, you know, we had chairs, we had staple guns, like we stapled Fala's manager's tie to his head. <laughs> um, we Fala has no shoes. So at one point the manager threw powder and he missed and he hit his he hit Fala and Fala ends up walking into the thumbtacks. Vinny and hates wrestlers place explode. Like, Vinny uh, hates wrestlers with no shoes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> He wears shoes now. He well, thank God now. for that. Thank God for small yeah. miracles because, first of all, it's unhygienic. And second of all, I just yeah. <laughs> but it was a great spot because we were like, dude, it's just it's right there. Like, so it was like all these things made sense that what we did and how we did it, and um, we all put that together. Like me, Moff, Eric, you know, like at one moment we just sat there and kind of spitted ideas at each other, and then that all came about. And it was like honestly, like I've I've. And then they go, we want to do it again next month. And I'm like, dude, like, we got to do it again? Like, how are we going to top it? So, of course, I already had that figured out. And it was like, you know, so we did uh second one back a bit. But I ended up winning the first one. I, I retained, um, I won it back in the first one. So, which was, like, pretty cool. You know, I didn't no idea I was going to even, I didn't think I was going to be near it again. And um, so that was a pretty cool idea when they, when they did it. Um, just cause it was shock factor, you know, shock value. And I think it just, they screwed, you know, it's just story. It just, it just works so well. Cause people were mad at me now. They were pissed that I won. They want him off the win. Now and then we did it again. Yeah. Are you more of a, uh, again and Moff, Moff won. are you more of a, uh, call it on the fly kind of wrestler or do you plan the matches out ahead of time? I was going to ask that. As well. um, Sorry, I like, man. I like to have, I like to have our business figured out yeah as far as i always say like i was always telling guys when you're calling matches and i'm, I'm probably exposing stuff now but it's all right um i was always telling guys you have um five five basic spots when you want to kind of do a, a, a match a, a match um wrestling wise they're always like shine cut off heat come back finish that's like your basic recipe of match mm. right so we're like i always kind of tur turned around to where is you have your beginning you have the middle and you have an end you know what i mean like so you have your, your beginning, middle, end. How do you get from the beginning to the middle? How do you get from the middle to the end? So these are your three main parts. Just fill it in with these two. You know what I mean? Mm. 
beginning, middle, and end. Every story in time has a beginning, a middle, and an end. How do you get from A to B? You know, how do you get from B to C? It's just, that's kind of telling you what you're doing. And then everything is just different. Depends on your opponent, depends on how your body feels. <laughs> Depends on what you're doing, where you're at, what the crowd is, you know, certain things. So, so obviously there's guys that you wrestled a lot with and you're comfortable with that you can do things and the other guy knows exactly what you're going to do before you even do it. And then other guys you're going to have to prepare in advance more with that. You're, you're not really, uh, you don't have the same chemistry. Yes, right. that's definitely yeah. Every every guy, everybody's different who you're working with, so that's a really uh, big factor of how the match is going to go too. Um, but I I'm comfortable like doing stuff on the fly and calling it, and I always tell everybody just that slows you down because if you don't know what's coming next, right? Why are you all? Why are you running? Where are you going? <laughs> like. It, it, so that there, kind of would pace you too is you know because we uh, practice was always on the fly matches when i was in ovw with rip it was on the fly matches it was six minutes to go and there were tag matches too and you were the only guy driving so at one point he was like you're the you're you're leading so it's my match so if anything oh, okay. up in that match it's my fault okay but i'm i'm controlling my baby face partners and my tag partner so i'm literally directing traffic to everybody okay and so that that's was what we did and it was one guy was driving, you know, and everybody else had their roles. Babyface listened. Heel partner helped out. And, you know, we just – because we had like 30, 50 people at times. So that was tag six-minute tag match, go. Six-minute tag match, go. That's how we learned. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't even aware that – I mean, I probably should have thought that, but I wasn't aware that there was like one person in that match that is the driving force. I thought maybe there was, you know, they have – all right, this is how we're going to start. We're going to hit this many spots and this is how we're going to finish. And, you know, the ref yeah. is telling you pretty much what's going to happen at what time. Um, yeah. I wasn't aware that there's the one guy who's like, okay, I'm directing the whole match. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it depends. Like, again, I said, it, it depends. Usually, um, you know, I was always kind of like, if you're working with a younger guy, it's like, all right. I always attribute to some guy, somebody's driving and someone's in the passenger seat. So it's like, I'm driving, you know? But when you get a mix of people that have the same amount of experience and time and, and character and all these things, then it becomes, there's been, I think that's where some of the best matches I've had comes when everybody puts in their ideas and we just, yeah. we just go, okay, let's put yours here, mine there, and then his behind that. It's like, okay, cool. You know, and just things like that work out. It all depends. It's, you know, like I said, everything's different on it. But some people, you've really got to kind of, you know, plan things out. When it's TV and it's more, um, not, I wouldn't want to say important, but I mean, like, if it's on a bigger scale, like, yeah. you really want to kind of know what's going on. But, yeah. you know, you want to hit it. You want, sure that. Yeah. Um, you hit I would more spots. of, like, what's, what's the business that we're trying to get over in this segment? You know, what's the main purpose of this? And... Always, I was always kind of like find that main purpose and how do you how do you get there? You know, let's work our way backwards. So if you're going to end up doing this, what would you do before that? Well, mm -hmm. I'd probably do this. It's like okay, and then you just kind of see where things go, and then you know, I just like to get make sure that we get the business part over of what they want for the match because that's why we're here too. Is right. You know, at the end of the day, it's uh, you know, I may be guilty of it too. Everybody's at one time, but it's it's whatever they want, so it doesn't matter. You know, like. It's like work. Eventually, we're going to do it the boss's way. So, <laughs> yeah, just, just do it. You know. <laughs> so I looked up online. You know, you look up most sex and it's you know it's, it's VFWs and everything. But you look up Mary Bacara yeah. or Bokara, and you fought a four way tag or four way match with Sammy Callahan, yep. Matt McIntosh, and Kenny Omega. And you almost tapped out Kenny Omega until Matt McIntosh pinned Sammy Callahan. I couldn't find the history of what that match led up to, but we both hate Kenny Omega. But and I, <laughs> and, and I hate Sammy Callahan. And we both hate Sammy Callahan. <laughs> how did you how, – like, you wrestled a million names that I've named already. You f fought and almost tapped out. The guy who's the belt collector, how yeah, did that? Three. How did you lead up to that? What led to that match that you almost won? Um, well, they were um, 
just I guess like as I was coming off of you know title loss and things like that, it was like where do where do we go with that character now? So they was trying to bring in more competition or bigger names, and I just started doing a couple single stuff, and uh, they they were going to bring in Kenny, and Kevin's real good friends with Kenny. Uh, he knew him from FCW back in or deep, I think it was no, it was Deep South before they went to FCW. Kevin Matthews was in Deep South with Kenny Omega when he was there. Um, so they were close, and um, they were going to bring him in, and then um, it was going to be one on one, and then I'm not too sure exactly what made it turn into the four-way but i think mcintosh might have been working callahan somehow they it it trans i have no idea how it turned about it was supposed to be originally a one-on-one um and then things that you know they storyline wise too they added matt mcintosh and sammy callahan um so it was a four-way match then and mcintosh ended up winning that match because he i think i don't think he was you know he wasn't the champion but it was like more like a number one contenders type of, you know, match. Um, so which was getting, you know, uh, Macintosh over, but it was just the way it worked out. And then, you know, Sammy worked a lot with Kenny. I think everybody kind of, usually when I did some matches, I think everybody also tries to um, work with as many people that they can, they can and newer people that they've never worked before and people in the industry that they want to get in the ring with. And PWS gave that opportunity to a lot of people. Like, so Kenny wanted to work with Sammy, Sammy wanted to work with Kenny. Um, it was like Starling when we did with Cody Rhodes and Leo Rush. That was another situation where this is very similar. Mm. And it was like more the merrier because I'm like, yeah, I get to work with Leo. And Cody's like, yeah, so do I. So it's like, this is great, you know? So it kind of was like, it was just great to be in there with everybody. And uh, I really wasn't in there much with Kenny too much with a couple little things, but even Sammy too, because it's a four way, you know, and you're doing you a little a bit of here and there. Triggers. Yeah. So, um, and I think that was like just. It, just the way we were figuring out who's going to do what and to put Kenny where. And it was like, it kind of made sense to put him in the arm bar. And he's great because he's just so like, he'll do whatever anybody wants, you know, whatever, you know, as long as everything is safe, makes sense. And he's just easy to work with. And, um, and some people, when you're in there with like a, a Kenny Omega or like set of, like a Cody Rhodes, like that's like, it's just different, man. Like the crowd's different mm-hmm. there. You know, it's just a different feeling when you're out there with, certain guys of a you know a certain level and um so it, we were just like it just makes sense for him to be there and then who knows you know what i mean like that was the whole point of, of him helping me out to getting the character over and it was just worked with the way the finish was but um it was pretty cool you know <laughs> i'm not gonna lie yeah um, he had great you to up work to, with kenny especially seeing to, the way things are he had you up to do the one wing and angel you slid down his back you put him in the arm bar and then Matt McIntosh rolls over uh, Sammy Callahan. He pins him. And then you get jumped. Like, five guys come out and jump you. Okay. See ya. Totally don't even remember that. <laughs> I, I watched it on YouTube the Totally other day, don't remember that. And, like, five people come out and jump you. And it's like, what are you doing? Why are you jumping <laughs> Mario? I got nothing, dude. I got nothing. <laughs> I can't recall that at all. I I remember something of something going on afterwards, but I have no idea who it was. I mean, I really it was a don't. phenomenal match. And like, you know, we said we're not Kenny Omega or Sammy Callahan fans, but the match itself, I mean, you guys are hitting spots back and forth. You're almost getting the one wing angel. You get into the arm bar, the roll up, and the match just ends. And then all of a sudden, all these people come out and start jumping you. And then, <laughs> then all these yeah. other people come out and start helping you. And it, it was like, it, and I couldn't find the follow up match or the follow up storyline. But uh, you're you're watching yeah. it, and it was like one of those matches where you're like, I need to see what happens next. Yeah, that way it was fun with PWS, and they had like some public access TV, and they t- we were we were telling stories, and I'm I'm always just like, man, like a lot of promotions in general, and I think wrestling in general is just um, book by book show, you know, like their storylines, but there's not a really a lot of storylines like when there's a story behind something man it's just it, people get invested so much easier it's so much better to like tell stories of the matches and determines what you're going to do what moves yep. you should do what style the match should be the way it should go you know how it should feel so it's like those things are, are just different you know but now you go from all that and uh, i know Vinny has a lot of questions about like 
today's what's going on today, but how did the Impact journey start? I I, I saw you on Impact. You were with uh, – Fa- uh, I'm never going to say his Fala, name, right? Yeah, Falaba. Falaba. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we had actually uh, – I had gotten a call from Danny Cage and Monster Factory, and they were uh, – this is when Punisher, Damian Priest, was still down uh, – Matt Riddle was still down there. And Danny was like, I'm doing this tournament, uh, Punishers in the finals. I want, I want to bring you in and work with them to the finals. It's like, yeah, this is great. It's like, I love to, I always wanted to go to monster factory and, um, did the tournament and did that with Danny. And, uh, first match I took a <laughs> big bump on the mat. First, like real big bump I took there and the rings a little bit harder there. And it kind of tweaked my back Makes and fun. I was, yeah, I was in bad shape for a little bit after that first match. And, uh, Danny's like, we'll, we'll call an audible right now. What do you want to do? And I was like, no, nah, man. It's like, I'll be good. And uh, stuck it out and then did the finals of Punisher and was a great match. And Danny's like, dude, he's like, you're a friggin' stud, man. He's like, you're awesome. It's like, thanks, man. And uh, they were just super respectful there. As a QT was there, QT Marshall was down there and locker room was great. And it was just so, I just loved going down there. So we, he's like, anytime you guys want to come, just come right down. And me and Fala, were, I brought Fala with me. And we started coming down. He goes, I'm going to throw you together. I'm going to make you a tag team. And we're going to call you uh, m- the money in the miles. The only thing that counts is the money in the miles. And we, uh, so I was like, all I, all I cared about was, I was like, can we come out to turn the page by Metallica? <laughs> and he goes, yeah. He goes, so it was like, we got to, cause I think Bob Seger's a little too slow. Yeah. So we, uh, we, we got it to where he did Metallica and it was like, it was awesome. Like it was perfect. Everybody liked it just because everybody liked the song too. Right. Nice. Um, so he put the tag titles on us and then next thing we know, we're like just running with them. And it's like, I had always wanted to go, I was going to go sign up there like 17 years ago to wrestle. And now I'm the monster factory tag team champion. Like that blew my mind. And um, Danny would bring in a best. And so he was doing stuff with impact and, um, you know, he knew me too from PWS and we worked together already and Danny, we were just working and doing stuff. And then, um, Jeff Jarrett had come down with global force wrestling. They worked with Pat Buck and PWS right before wrestle pro ch- transition. PWS became wrestle pro. We were with Jeff and global force. And, uh, so I had met all those people and got to work with them. And it was like, by the time, um, impact had changed. So Jeff got into it with impact. Jeff changed. Um, was back with Impact Wrestling and they were changing things up with Global Force and they were right when the Hardys were right before the Hardys came back they were doing a um, tag team thing where they were I think they were taking titles from teams around, around the Indies yeah I remember that yep so we were going to come in and work the Hardys and they were going to take tag titles off us like, this is awesome and um, then that didn't happen. Things changed. Like literally that week, things changed. <laughs> like all of a sudden you hear about the Hardy Boys and it's like, okay, well, that's not happening. They're like, no, it's all right. Just come down. You know, still come down. And um, so we came down and like I said, it was like we knew Jeff, we knew Danny, like, and they were looking for international flair. And it was like, so we came out and we, and, um, we got to work with um, Angel Garza, Laredo Kid, and it was uh, Shira. Ma, um, he signed with WWE, but Ma, I always mess up his first name. Shira, he was a, a big guy from India. In Impact, I'm not 100 percent sure who you're talking about. Yeah, but we got to work with them, and uh, it worked out really well. And, and then, um, you know, they 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 liked what they saw with us, and we ended up getting you know a couple matches, and then they put us together, call back, and it's like we just kept coming. You know, they. We, we did that first set of tapings. Um, I think they ma- ma- you fly yourself down, you cover all your stuff, whatever it is. And then uh, we got an email after the first set of tapings on the next time that they wanted to bring us back and sign a, a one year deal. So it was, uh, you know, you get paid per appearance. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't much. It was, at the time, I think they were $500 for people, but that came down to like 250 because, it's, you know, it's just the it's just the way it is. I can't see anybody making money by paying. We were like, they're paying us that, you know, we were like nobody compared to, you know, people that have been there. So it's just, it's just, um, you know, it was, it was validation of some sort, you know, it was great. Um, but a lot of things were still changing at the time. So 
it just um then i got hurt too and it was you know i was already in a lot of bad shape too coming around injuries and things and it was just like a lot of personal things were going on too family and life and uh you know health and a lot of things too so just combination of things that uh eventually <clears throat> you know i didn't end up getting a a call back for i think it was like august taping august was the last set i did and then the next one before that was like November, which was way long compared to what they were running. You know, they were doing like every month and now it was like every three months. So it's like, you know, so, uh, and then eventually they just, yeah, it's like stopped calling. And that was basically that. So I when, tried reaching out, no answer. So when you go, when you hurt you, you tore your ACL, you tore your meniscus. Yeah. When did, did you have an expectation that you were going to end up back in impact when you healed up and I, I know i think was that like your career ending injury those two um no that that was close to it but that wasn't it <laughs> <laughs> um that was close to it um yeah because i actually i i tweaked my i i i know i damaged my meniscus when i was wrestling um at impact i was working with uh alberto dario's brother um they were kind of taking a look at him too. And right in the beginning, we were chain wrestling. I spun, took him down, I spun around and I felt something tweak in my knee. And I was like, Oh, mm, that was weird. You know, like that. It was all right. Then it was sore after that, for like two weeks, like real sore. And then maybe a month later, a month or two later, I was coaching and literally I was on the mat showing somebody like I was, you know, my knee was up and he pulled me to roll me over and I didn't go with him right away. And that was literally, that was it. Mm. Like my meniscus, tore even worse and then i couldn't straighten my leg and i was in excruciating pain <laughs> so eventually i got it looked at it was acl and meniscus got that replaced and by the time i got that replaced um things changed with with impact and then it was uh you know at that point i was just kind of like i don't when we were there uh we had also been told you know certain like we'd have certain matches sometimes or we were going to work with certain people and then things changed. I understand things change all the time, you know, but, um, we were doing, you know, a lot of, we were told that we were kind of like the power and glory of impact wrestling. He's, which basically meant that we were going to maybe get a win on a house show or something, but other than that, they don't see anything more for us. And I'm like, power and glory. You're talking Paul Roma and Hercules. Yeah, right. And you, you look, I mean, and obviously they didn't go too far, you know, and it's like, I just, we're hoping, you know, we're, we're trying to see what they're going to do because we have no idea what they're doing with us. We're just working matches, you know, and um, creative is a lot really up in the air. Things were still just, you know, and um, we were just kind of doing whatever they asked us to do, you know. And, but when you tell somebody like, that's kind of what we're, what you're going to be, it's like, how do you put a cap on someone like that? How do you know, you know, like you haven't even really tried things. Like we haven't even done a story. We haven't even gotten into a face-to-face -face promo with anybody on the roster. Like what happens if you bump into that guy, you know, like just, we had done nothing. So how do you tell, like, this is what we're going to be. Um, so I'm always just like, you know, I guess you kind of see the writing on the wall. It's like, if that's all they see for me, yeah. you know? Now, with Fallop still being in Impact, is there any chance that you might – I mean, I don't even know if you could still wrestle, but is there any chance if you could, would you still be able to go to Impact, maybe like do an, uh, a reunion or anything like that? Um, I mean, I would, I would, of course, be willing to do a reunion with Fallop at some point if they ever did. I mean, I'd be willing and open to do anything. Um I would totally go back in a heartbeat anywhere at that point. Right now, I don't even know if I'm going to wrestle. I mean, I think at some point there's going to be one more in me at least, but um, I know that for a fact. <laughs> so I know I can't say I'm never going to get in there again. Um, but I don't know when that next time is going to be, you know? So working with um, Impact, I would do I would do anything right now. I would do a referee's job if anybody wanted me to, but <laughs> – um, but yeah, I would totally, I would love to work with Impact. I mean, a lot of people I know, um, you know, Hawkins too, got, uh, Kurt Hawkins is there now. Um, so many people are there. It's like, um, I never wanted to not be there. It's just, 
fate turned out the way it did and a lot of things piled up but um i would in general uh like to move i always just kind of like to move you know to something on something else kind of like you know yeah. like i don't want i don't want i don't want to get involved with an ex-girlfriend kind of <laughs> <All right. laughs> you know but um i'm not saying you know but i would totally do anything but you know i would love to i just whatever the star you know stars seem to align for me will but I would totally go back to Impact and do something. I don't know if anybody would even remember or care at that point, but <laughs> we would. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Maybe you could be like a, a manager too if you can't wrestle or some or some sort yeah, of. Yeah, you know. I would. Yeah, I would manage too in a heartbeat. I loved manager when I was hurt, so I was yeah. doing that too. So yeah, I'm never saying never. I'm never. You know, right, right. now I'm just trying to get in, stay in uh, pretty good shape, and I'm yeah. going to whatever. Last year I didn't go to anything because everything was shut down anyway. So. Right. Last year was the first year I've never, I didn't go to any wrestling show for an entire year. Now, what's that? You know? If you, Vinny, the, if you're going to ask a question, I, 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 I'm I, going to the bathroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, excuse me one second. What, what's the, um, you know, with the ACL and the MCL, what is the recovery time for an injury like that? Uh, where that you could, that you would feel, I mean, I don't even know if you can ever get back to, what shape you were in before that, but where you yeah. feel you're comfortable at that. Okay. Maybe now I can perform again. Like how long from when you get injured to when you could rehab to feel comfortable to get back in the ring. Yeah, I did. I think this time around, it took me like a good, probably eight to 10 months at wow. least. I don't think I wrestled till, you know, um, First time I tore, I've torn both ACLs. So first time I tore my left one was in OVW. Um, and that was like a, that was like in about eight months. Cause that's like always your, my biggest fear when you get hurt is re hurting, redoing it, yeah. you know, like and going back too soon, you know, not being smart about it. You know, and I always have, a, you know, my, my brace that I'd wear with it for a long time, but man, to get comfortable, I honestly, it's like I said, it's like, like Chris Statlander just had her ACL repaired. She came back 10 months, 10 months. And that to me is smart. Yeah. I, some people yeah. try to come back in four or in five. And it's like, who cares how fast you come back? Nobody they really cares right. how fast you come back. They want yeah. you to come back better than you left. That's your only goal when you get hurt <laughs> is motherfucker. You better come back better than you were before you left. Right. And you when know, you look wise, everything, when you come back from an injury like that and you step into the ring for the first time, how much is that playing on your, on your mind? Like psychologically, like, Oh, if I do this, am I going to re injure myself? If I do that, how, how much of that plays a part in how good you're performing or, or is there a, a point in that match or that it, it gets wiped away from your 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 thinking at all yeah well i came back in a rumble so which was cool because it was a surprise thing too awesome. and i had gone back to croatia so people thought i was still in croatia so it was really cool doing it um which was easier though because i didn't have to do much i could slide in and people fed me you know and it was easier boom you're out yeah. nice and quick but when you're getting in with matches and stuff too but that's through you you're thinking when you have to think too much about what you have to do and how you're doing it and while you're doing it it's not good. It's yeah. not a good thing. Um, it starts to become dangerous when you're doing things like that. Even before you get in there, you're like, no, I probably shouldn't do that. You know, like we shouldn't do that. <laughs> so, you know, it's always in the back of your mind. And I've, I've gotten matches months later where, you know, I put a guy in a sharpshooter and as I'm turning, I'm like, that doesn't feel good. Yeah. Something doesn't feel good. So then I'm slowing down, you know, and then I end up turning the opposite way <laughs> just to save my leg and it's a little right. more awkward to turn the guy but i had to do what i had to do because i didn't like the way that i felt right so i turned the other way and when you're doing those things it's not i said it's not good it's not good for you your opponent and i just started coming back like this was the first time i came back like and i was i got sick too over in croatia i had contracted like h pylori it's like uh you know like a, i had some bad food like bad chicken or something and it was already like eating away at me kind of. So like I came back and I looked worse than I did when I left. Oh, so that was the first time where I was like, oh, that's not good, you know? And it just started to become um, not good when I'd get out. Like it just wasn't, the feeling was different and it was hard to justify the risk versus the reward. 
at that mm. point. Um, and then after that, it was like I ended up getting what ultimately finally took me out was like four concussions back to back. Oh, shit. Yeah. I took basically four good headshots and three matches consistently, like back to back to back. And um, yeah, it was just not good. I didn't feel good after matches. Um, a lot of um, uncontrollable like emotions and um, headaches and like just depression, irrationality, like mm -hmm. it's just so much bad stuff that I would never wish on anybody. And most yeah. people will never fully understand the stuff and just say, Oh, he, Oh, he quit. <laughs> but yeah, it he, actually ended me in the hospital for about five days. So. Yeah, people, people don't understand how serious that is. And you know, you like I have played football, so you're getting, head injuries without even knowing about it when you're young and now you're going into a sport where there's a lot more i mean i'm sure that you've taken chair shots at a point in your career oh yeah we and, did on, we did all that stupid shit and nobody knew that that was dangerous for you until recently you know and, and yeah it, it's a real scary thing when you go through an injury i've had two or three concussions i broke my jaw playing football uh i went to bed i didn't wake up for 15 hours afterwards yeah. You know, you're not supposed to go to sleep after that. I've yeah. gotten hit in the head and I lost three hours of time. And I yeah. was like, and, and people were like, oh, we were still playing tackle football at the park and you were doing this. And I'm like, I have no recollection. Yeah, no recollection of that. Yeah, it's whatsoever. scary. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I got my first one in high school too. So yeah. I was playing football. Yep. So it's like God knows how, how many were actual, you know, as you were, as you were going by, but. Yeah, it was like I had matched him. Bell rang, guy came. I picked him up, charged him in a corner. He came back out with a like a V trigger, boom, right on the money. I mean, he caught me, and uh, that so that one messed me up. I didn't feel good after that. We had great matches though, still. And then uh, I worked with one of one of my students, and we were I was always throwing Germans, so he was doing them, uh, doing them to me, teacher versus student kind of thing. And back of my head kept hitting the front of his head. Um, happened twice. In, in the same match right there. So that was two more shots. Um, and then I worked another, I, I, I had done German off the second rope. Guy would be a run up easy kind of, I would just kind of back one above the second rope, literally. Um, I'd hold on, the guy didn't jump and he slipped and it just bam, came down right on my head in between the mat. And uh, I would just, after matches, man, like it just did not feel good. Like, it was just like, I had felt like I was in a mini car crash, like every time. And uh, it just was getting bad. So I ended up, my last one though, my last one ended up being um, for HCW, Hungarian Championship Wrestling in Hungary. I got connected with a guy, uh, Chris Jokic from Croatia, who I met through Instagram. Okay. And he has a, a, a training dojo there but it's more of like a, an actual gym for now with um you know matt's where he does the wrestling but i don't know how things are really running now with the way covid went um but i went there i did a seminar in croatia with him too and we had like eight people and a couple of kids and stuff so it was really cool like just to be there and like bring wrestling to croatia because croatia doesn't have wrestling like there's right. you know like there's like none of it there like there's no promotions there's no indie shows really like so he goes to hungary and wrestles and uh I had talked with the promoter from there, a really nice guy. He came to visit in the U.S., and I met, met with him there, and eventually we worked something out. I did a seminar for his students, too. And we had, like, 30, 40 people there. It was awesome. And super nice people. And we ended up doing their, was like their biggest show of the year was uh, Bloody November. And it's, like, um, you know, just, like, kind of like their end-of-the-year show, big show. And it's in this massive place with, like, I don't know. It must have been a couple thousand, at least two. Like, you know, it was just big. It was over a thousand, but, and they had screens and it was just such a big production. It was awesome. It was always like, and I kind of already knew going in, this was probably going to be my last one. Cause I'd already been in a hospital actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I'd already booked the flight and I had already had the set and booked. So I went in the hospital the first week of October and this match was in November. <laughs> So <laughs> kind of was like, so that was, uh, that was my last one. And I kind of knew it at the time. And it was like, that was a bucket list for me was I never got to wrestle in Europe. Yeah. And 
Yeah. I got to wrestle in Europe. That's cool. So, now we and we we've cool. interviewed uh, PN mm -hmm. News, who yeah. actually just opened a wrestling school in Dubai. Wow. And uh, I know he's looking for people. I mean, like we can set you up with him if you ever wanted to get back into it. And he's actually—he actually lives in uh, Austria. I think he lives in Austria, right? I think, he, yeah, I think it's Austria or Germany or something right around. But his wrestling school is in Dubai, and he's been—you know—when he talked to us, he said that he's looking for people, and, trainers, and yeah, yeah. coaches. I, eventually, yeah. when things start to pan down, I was—I still wanted to get back out to Europe, you know, like so. That was like the whole point of getting out there too, is to try to do some stuff too, like. Chris, we wanted we wanted to run a show in in like Zadar, the main town of Croatia, like like one capital of Croatia, like in the square there. But I was always like, that's what I want to do, <laughs> you know? Right. Now, Absolutely. Now I have to ask the question I asked to everybody that we've interviewed here. Sure. If you, if you had a contract in front of you from every company, AEW, oh TNA, or Impact, WWE, NXT, NWA, who are you signing with right now? wow and why like who's who's the person in that league that you want to sign with because you want to wrestle that guy oh that's so unfair <laughs> i'm so i'm sorry mario like <laughs> that's an unfair question um damn uh I, honestly i think just for me personally right now i'm talking about my age my um you know character um uh, the body that I'm working with right now and the, and the injuries and everything like that. I think if, if, if I had my choice, uh, it would probably be either, <laughs> uh, I'd go with probably AEW just because, um, I feel like there would be, I feel like there would just be more opportunity to be yourself and do your thing, um, and see what happens, uh, where I feel like, if it was in WWE where it would be through NXT, I guess first, well, automatically you're going to go to NXT, right? You know, it if it's the... for me, they're going to, if it's for me, they're bringing me to, you know, like they would be bringing me into NXT. So, um, which I would work for any one of them. So I, I would love to also, I mean, I would still love to, but I just felt like, like you said, right now, if you put these in front of me right now, at this, this point in time, right now, I would sign AEW just because of opportunity to, uh, see see what I could do and see how things go. It's just a matter too of um, I think there's just more opportunity to work with younger talent too and try yeah. things out and do new matches and um, just be out there. And um, I just think too, I just I, I honestly feel like there's such a big market that could be dealt with with Croatia that I'm really like that's like my main my real why <laughs> of even coming back is I. I just want to represent and do the best I can for the Croatian part of it because it really got over with people like everybody in country knew me. I had no idea. Like it was in newspapers there and it was like, yeah, my family was like, everybody knows who you are. That's awesome. Everybody. And That's I was awesome. like, no, they're like, yes. <laughs> I You posted articles. I saw them. It's fucking awesome. It blew my mind. I was like, holy shit. Like well, was, that was the only time my, my, my social media ever exploded. I, I, like, I really what the fuck, dude. <laughs> like, aside I have from, no idea the article even came out, and I'm like, this is horseshit. I'm like, I must have signed <laughs> up for something, you know? I, like, I must have did something wrong. I feel uh, aside from you know my neighbors that live like three blocks away that were, I mean, three houses away that were Croatian. I knew nothing about Croatia until recently, and the country is absolutely beautiful. Oh, it's and amazing! No, and no one, I don't really think people even know anything about Croatia and yeah. the fact that you can actually bring it, you know, to the spotlight being a wrestler there, even if you could like, like you said, tap the untapped resource yeah, you know, to bring knowledge about that country. Like I said, I look at, it, I'm like, wow, this is like a hidden gem. You know, no one. Yeah. It's such a beautiful country. It's, yeah. it's become a destination for a lot of people and they're fine. That, like game of Thrones, like uh, King's landing was Dubrovnik. It was taken yeah. in Croatia. Like, yeah. It's awesome. I love Game of Thrones. That's like my all-time oh, yeah, yeah, me too. I'm, <laughs> I'm like one of the only human beings that has never watched that show ever. Yeah, ever you need at to start. all, ever, never? No. Need to start. Need to start. Never yeah, watched, watched one episode. The, I watched the first season all the way to the end, and I was like, right? <laughs> then I missed from season two through seven. 
and I saw the I saw the beginning of eight. And the first episode of eight, I was like, how the fuck did this happen? <laughs> so then I had to go back and watch everything. And then I got hooked. It was awesome. Now, Mario, you're going to understand this. I'm not going to let Ryan know what is going on since he's never watched it. Okay. But I was, reading the, I was reading the book originally. Oh, I guess I don't have to watch it because you're going to fucking spoil it for me. No, I'm not. I'm not, <laughs> not, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you shit, but it's going to make you want to watch it now. So I'm reading the book. And I was like, well, I don't really know. So a lot of characters, a lot of characters, a lot of their names are similar. So I was like, let me start watching the series. So I started watching the series. I put faces to names, started reading the book. And I got to one part in the first book. And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about because it happens in the first season as well. And I took the book and I was like, fuck you. And I threw it across the room. And, the end? and then I continued to watch the show and finish the books. But I was so mad at that point. I was like, how could you do that? I, yeah. thought it was, I thought the show was and the book were about one thing and it completely flipped it on its head. Yeah. yeah. So, Ryan, now you're going to have to watch it. Now I got to watch. Now I got to watch. I, I got to be one of these fucking, no offense to you two, one of these assholes that watches Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah. So. so but it was good though. But yeah, but that was where I said it. That was, you know, part of Croatia too. So it's like, there's so many beautiful beaches. Oh yeah. Like pe- there's beaches and mountains. Like there's a fucking mountain and there's a beach on the bottom. Yep. Like, I, I watched, like, I watched people are like mountains or beach. I'm like, well, if you go to Croatia, you just get oh. both. <laughs> I, 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 I was actually watching a show, uh, my wife below deck, uh, on Bravo or something. And it's about sailing oh, yeah, they, nuts, mm-hmm. and they go to Croatia. I was like, Wow, I didn't even realize Croatia was like that. Yeah, I would have had yeah. no idea. Oh, I'd go, I'd go back every year if I could, but it's just so expensive. And yeah, you know, eventually it'd be like, I, I was, I thought about staying there for a little while. Yeah, we're like we can open up a wrestling school. Hey, we could. Why not? They're <laughs> saying, you know, yeah. you're like, so it's just to be able to do stuff there too, and like you know, bring wrestling to it. It's like it's, it said all everything is like is like a first. Because it's oh, yeah. never been done, and like even the the guy I met Chris, and he's got his own studio in school. Like he found out about me through Instagram, and he was like, "Dude, you were such like an inspiration for Croatia, like for me too." He's like, "Because like you know, we got a guy. Well, I was the first guy to walk out with the Croatian flag on national TV for Impact, like you know, on TV it was like in wrestling. I mean, there's other people that were from Croatia in general, like uh, Nikolai Volkov was originally Croatian. Okay. Um, they even announced it when it was on the network. <laughs> when they had they had stuff. Remember about the him. network when that remember existed? Remember the network that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, now I they got the that. shitty thing with. I miss that NBC. Uh, hopefully, we'll get it back. But dude, I miss it. I'm so upset that it's yeah. gone. But he wrestled the match, and it was like they announced him from Croatia, and I was like, <laughs> you know, like what blew my mind too. I was like, wow. Um, but yeah, it's just my my family over there too. Everybody was it's just like everybody was so proud and it was like they were so happy. And it was, you know, like I was using our name, like their name. Like it's my real name. And that's what's awesome about it. And it's my real nationality. It's not bullshit. The the accent is, you know, induced, but <laughs> uh it's a character, you know. But I mean, that's the whole point. I mean, look at Apollo Cruz. I relate similar to what that just happened with Apollo Cruz is similar to the character that I that how I did with my character. But you transition know, from speaking normal to transitioning to a character that has an accent from another country. You did it more of a uh, you left for a little while and you came back and you were you know most oh yeah way to, different. You yeah. didn't do it from one week of SmackDown to well, the next well, week of yeah. SmackDown. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Same. I, I I liked it too, but honestly, I'm I'm a. It's one of those things where people, like you just said, you just saw him last week. I feel like if it was one of those things where, like, where when he debuted on the roster, he was that, yeah, and he was different in NXT. People would have been like, okay, but or even since go he was on the main roster already. Fans are kind of like uh, bullshit. Or even go on a hiatus for six months, and you know, I mean, they put they put the fiend out there. They, they they left him off TV for three months and brought him back. You could have done that with Apollo Cruz, and not for nothing, not nothing against Apollo Cruz because he's very athletic. But no one would have gave a shit, or no one would have remembered that he was just this guy who spoke regularly. Because he, he, he was got, he was a nobody before. Yeah, that. he wasn't he wasn't somebody who was really on the rate. I mean, he's great. 
Oh, he's, <laughs> but he's not a great person, but it was, yeah. yeah, he, he, he needed some, he had, he had all the tools to do something. It just right. needed, needed a little <laughs> rocket strapped to him or helped out a little bit or, yeah. you know, just, he needed something. Right. And I think the character is great. I think yeah, that's this, what he needed. This will definitely help him. Cause I remember watching yeah. NXT and when I first saw him, like, dude, this guy's doing backflips, stand, just straight standing, no, not having to run, not have to jump yeah. off anything. I was like, you know, just athletic. He he's phenomenal. And I was what I go. All he does is smile. That's his gimmick. He smiles, and he's got no no um, depth. And now this has a little bit of depth to him. I don't. I oh yeah, with the with the athletic ability he already has and the talent in the ring. And now you're like you said, you're doing that depth of the character, which is the same sense too. Now it's like what he's going to be, what what he can essentially do with that because he has a character can be a lot less. Yeah, of, you know, like a lot more physical, crazy high stuff. So when he whips it out, you're like, dude, this guy's incredible. You yeah. know, but with that character, it gives you so much more leeway to do character things, which is why it was always so important with my students too and coaching and stuff was just was the character. You have to know who the character is, where he is, where he's from, where he, his backstory. Like I, I was always like, okay, okay, I can do that. Like I, I can make that up. You know, like I can figure that out, but. Like, I was very comfortable and confident who the character was at the time, you know, and then things evolved and changed as far as, um, you know, injuries and things limit you. It's like, it's hard to be a certain way, you know. I don't expect to be undefeated in, and just like a Goldberg type character forever. Right. Of course, you know, like that's never going to happen. Nobody, you know, um, it's just as time goes on too, you want to get invested in emotionally in yourself into into a story too where you can really because when you're invested the fans get way more invested you yeah, know when yeah. you're feeling it they're feeling it and everybody can really sink their teeth into something and do good so i think i've always like it doesn't matter where you are in the card as far as the titles or matches whatever it is but like just give me a story man like i just really just like to tell stories yeah and that was always like my biggest thing when i would just do indies and things like that it was always just like a one and done and, uh, you know, I like a little more than that. I like to, you know, be able to tell stories and do stuff. So, I, I think Ryan will agree with me here is, you know, we're all in the age now. We've never left wrestling. You know, we right. grew up with the Hoko and the Macho Man. The Ultimate, and maybe we've, we've strayed away a couple times where we've like, oh, we've lost interest. And then we always come back. We always find our way back. The yep. demographic now in wrestling is not little kids. It's, so it's our whole, age. Yeah, so the whole right. NPT aspect of, I guess, is trying to get younger viewers, but they're also trying to incorporate a, a uh, another attitude error, I guess, per se. Right. It's not going to work with Peacock, you know, um, shooting birds out of Matt Riddle's ass and having train noises with Strowman running around the ring. Your demographic is still older. And, and of course, we're going to try to make our kids watch the product and stuff like that. But they, it comes to the point now, everything is the same recipe on Raw every week. It's, okay, we're yeah. going to have the promo with a guy or a handicap match, and then someone's going to run out, and then we're going to go to commercial. Now we're going to have a tag match, and then we're going to – and it's just the same thing, and it's nothing – and you're like, ugh. And then it's the silly, like, oh, let's throw tomatoes at John Morris and the Miz. And it just, I don't even think kids buy it as being funny. It, it, it's a, like, it's just silly at this point. Yeah. And I've got, I catch up more on stuff. I usually do, I do cross the two. So during the week, so usually by the time I get back, cause I really don't watch anything when it happens. I go back and kind of get updates on stuff, ups and downs. I do. I watch, get a lot of what culture stuff and check. Mm -hmm. um, what culture is awesome. It's mm -hmm. just, yeah. It's just easier to get all your information sometimes yeah. and go through, you get to go through the show and, you know, see things and stuff. Um, you know, and I think it's just such a weird time now too, for everything, because, you know, Pandemic. like you said, you're still, you're still going to come back and watch, you yeah. know, yeah, but, of course. and the, the ultimate attitude there was that 18 to, what was it? 18 to 48 demographic male or 18 to 44. And, something and, like and that. that's our audience actually for this show right. is, is, is and, if you look at the statistics on our anchor page, it, that's our audience is right. the people who listen to us are that age our right. age yeah our age and that was the attitude era crowd you know and that's now as like wrestling is transitioning like you're getting 
that it's because it's getting away from more of the, the kid oriented crowds because yeah but at the same time it's hard to shy away from them because the families are the ones that right. make the show and buy the stuff and buy yeah. the merchandise and they're going to bring six seven people with them because the kids freaking love it you know he goes nuts johnny loves this guy he's casey loves that guy you know like something for the girls something for the guys like it's so it it it's hard to shy away from it because when you start to do some things, parents can be like, we ain't coming to this shit no more. Yeah. You know? And yeah. I've seen people do that at independent. I've seen fans do that at the independent shows. I've seen them do that at shows when we were the Southside Players Club. <laughs> you know, like I've seen parents turn around and say, we ain't coming back. And I'm like, you got strippers I, I, with you. We're not coming back. I, I, had, I, felt, I feel horrible because that's, I mean, like, we're like, this is what they want, you know, whatever we're doing, doing. It's like, they're like, but, you know, things in general, it's just like that the demographic is toward, you know, the, it's hard because that's a big part of the, you know, company and, and the finances and, and like the kids and the yeah. family. But the 18 to 44 year old demographic kind of runs this shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. They're the yeah. ones that are like the, they're with it all the time. So they and now as AEW has been coming around doing the darks and elevations like like you were saying, oh, WWE has the same stuff. Similar going on like dark is essentially an elevation essentially is the same show same kind of format but there's different people you never know who you're going to see you never know where they're going to come from you never know what's going to happen who's going to show up like there's that surprise factor of it you don't know who and i think it's great bringing in local or independent talent oh, they're going to bring new viewers every time yeah. because their group people know that this guy or this one it's like so it, you know it helps to to bring things up and keep it fresh but that's as they're getting more edgy too, because they're being different than WWE product, that's going to be attractive to the 18 to 44 age group, yep. you know, and they're not getting that over here, you know? So I'm going to go by this chick's cool. I like her, you know, <laughs> like this one over here. I'm like, Hey, you kind of boring. you know, like not in general, but it's, you know, that's the demographic now too. So it's hard because they're trying to, you're trying to please everybody and you're not going to do that. Like, no. I have my, I have my, uh, you know, I have a five year old, and uh, he's obsessed with the Ultimate Warrior. You know, he yeah. runs around. He's like, and he's like, and he just know. wrestled some kid at the park today. Yeah, and whipped his ass. <laughs> he had a great arm bar too. You saw that arm bar that he yeah. had. Yeah, nice. <laughs> but um, so we're arm drag, t- whatever it is, arm drag take. <laughs> I don't know what he did. He did something. He fucking but, tapped um, a stranger kid out at the park <laughs> today. <laughs> he did. That's fucking great. But uh, you know, he's you should have taped it. He I did. have a couple pictures. Yeah, good. That's what you should shit, man. TikTok. Uh, hold on, here. Tell me. I'm gonna show you a TikTok. picture and tell me if this isn't a classic, a uh, wrestling move right here. This is a five five year old wrestling in the. Here you go. I so you can see that. Look at him. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> good job. This fucking kid is tapping then, some random is. kid He's out down on his knees. There, there he is. You go. Good for you. <laughs> but uh. Yeah, we're watching. I'd be we're so watching. proud, dude. I, would be I, so I proud. was proud. I was like, yo, yeah. kick my ass. <laughs> but I was uh, watching WrestleMania, and I'm a I'm a big Bray Wyatt fan. I think he's a genius when it comes to you know his gimmicks and stuff like that. He he's oh, yeah. I'll have something for you. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, he, he's on the par with Matt Hardy. How he can think up these gimmicks and and be able to run with them. He just turns everything he's done into gold to me. Yeah, great. Yeah, and we. We build, we build, we build. Bray Wyatt, Randy Orton. I mean, this is going back years when Randy Orton burnt down Sister Abigail's shed and, you know, uh, and they had the House of Horrors match. And now this is going to be Bray Wyatt overcomes Randy Orton, and this is the payoff. Two years, three years in the making. And we're watching it, and my son is a Fiend fan. He's yeah. all hyped up, and it's a three-minute match. Randy Orton beats The Fiend with an RKO when he took 12 stomps from Seth Rollins and it's over. And my son was hysterically crying. And I'm like, fuck this. And then WrestleMania was ruined the first night at that first night. Yeah. That was, yeah. That was, that, that was, uh, second night. That was second night. That was second I, went, second, I actually yeah. went to the second night because my, my, uh, my company had told me to, they only want you to go, get, you know, go to WrestleMania and get, you know, get yourself, um, you know, see, and it was like history, though. It's like it's a history making WrestleMania, and I got I got a better seat Sunday than I would if I got two two of them for each night. Um, 
I think Saturday night was the better card. Uh, I think yeah. it was, I think it was um, maybe a little more. I think too it was just more the way they booked it and did it in certain matches, and then it was yeah. a big baby face win at the end, so it made you feel yeah, yeah. good. Like it was a, I think it was a, it was just a, a fun card, um, yeah. and it felt like WrestleMania. I yeah. think the second night there were there were moments that felt like WrestleMania, but I feel like it was a little bit less than the first, just than the first night. Mm. But the Bray Wyatt, but being there live with fans again, just like to be with people and see everything. Like everybody there was going nuts. I feel like even after the match, they could have cared less what the finish was because it was like, yeah, dude, it was amazing to watch the entrances for both of them, yeah. you know, there live and see everything. And then we were like, it's over. I mean, like, and we're going yeah. back and we're watching it, you know, here. Yeah, it's way, it's way worse when you come back and watch it and you're not, you know, and you're on your couch and you're like, you know, but when you're there, nobody could care less. Everybody was so enthralled by the theatrics of it. And I just love the character anyway, with the whole theatrics too. And you know, like you said, I feel like everything, everything he does is just gold. Like every time he comes out, I just, I love everything about it. And it's like, at the same time, you just, just gotta try to enjoy it. I don't know. I mean, like just, you know, everybody's so critical about things and it's like, his, man, just his entrance, try to enjoy some of it. Oh, his entrance was amazing. His entrance was amazing. Oh, yeah. Um, the Alexa Bliss thing, I don't think they've explained it they, no. properly. Think, yeah, it's been yeah. explained yet. But I think everybody's feeling like it's, you know, obviously the transition of Sister Abigail, but I don't know if she's uh, going to even do that again. What, I kinda, where I kinda, does it go? Yeah. I kind of feel like they they have a direction and then Vince fires 10 writers and the other people that come in are like, uh, now what? And they're, they're like, oh, just start over. You know, and, I mean, I'm just interested to see where things go. I, I liked anything they did because I thought it was different, at least. It's just the character and how they did stuff. And with the pandemic, it changed TV. Yeah. It changed the way they oh, do everything. You know, it changed wrestling, too. So I, I, like, mean, I I love the the Thunderdome thing. Like, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. When I mean, they finally I, got going with that, it was like, yeah. I know AEW can Anybody. have fans because they're in the open the air thing. And NXT has some like wrestlers there when they do the stuff, uh, but I love the Thunderdome. I think it's like a, a cool concept. Yeah, even when they're uh, banging on the plexiglass to make more noise, I thought that was smart to be like, all right, now you're going to have more. Like when they first started watching and there's nothing, you're like, this is terrible. And then they start to end the, the screens and then banging on the, yeah. the plexiglass. You're like, all right, well now it's more. Yeah, they had to figure like, it I'm, out. Well, yeah. yeah, you're you know you're adding more atmosphere and more more things that we can we can use as well, right? Which is going to make things different. Now, so, did, did, did you, know. you watch Rebellion, Impact Rebellion? No, I, I did not see it, unfortunately. Now, me and V are not Kenny Omega fans by <laughs> any stretch. Um, let me ask you this: so you take the best guy in Impact, the the lesser of the three, Lee. Let's just take NWA out of the equation and you have WWE, AEW, Impact. You take okay. the top guy in the lesser of the three leagues and you bury him, essentially. I mean, Rizwan did a good job, but you're essentially burying him. Who's going to beat Omega now for the uh, Impact title? Nobody. There's nobody in the roster. I'm still saying Moose wins. I'm still saying Moose, Moose wins. Moose lost to Ra Rich Swan for the belt. So who's who's the guy that's going to step up and beat Kenny Omega? And that's why I think it was stupid that he won the belt. Because nobody in Impact... Oh, nobody's ever kicked out of the one-winged angel. Although you got out of it, and you put him in the <laughs> armbar. Who's going to come out and beat Kenny Omega now? I, I, I mean, yeah. Like, I'm... Obviously, I know I know Kenny would do business with anybody. It's not a point of who, you know, or him doing business. Or yeah, well, I'm, I'm done. talking kayfabe. It's just a matter of like, I, I, like what you're saying is, yeah, on a on an actual, you know, field of it, who who makes the most sense and who logically would actually, you know, would would be believable to to win. Um, yeah, I don't honestly, I can't answer that question either. I don't really know. It's like it's. I, I have a feeling he's going to have that for a while, I think. 
Um, I mean, I, I think we know when the match was announced in general that everybody was like, Rich Swan isn't winning this. Right. Yeah. I um, so, but it, I didn't get to watch it. I heard it was a great match, but I mean, but I, that's happened before too. Like I didn't get to see Kenny's first match with Okada and I heard how incredible that was. And when you, you know, when you watch a match and you don't know what the finish is and it's new, you're invested. Yeah. And you didn't get spoiled with it when you don't know who's winning. You watch that match in a whole different way. Mm -hmm. When you know the finish already and you're going to watch that match, it's way different. You're right. Not as, not as exciting. Yep. And I watched that match, and I already knew the finish of Omega and Okada, the first one, and I was literally on the edge of my seat, like still like, wow. And I knew the finish. That like never happened, you know? So oh. I was like, that's one of the mo uh, best matches I'd ever seen, like knowing who won and going into it. Like, it was just crazy. I, I but, kind of – I kind of felt that way with the Owens Reigns matches of late. Um, well, I believe it's the last man standing match. I mm -hmm. knew that Reigns was going to win, but Owens does so good at at making you believe that at any point he's winning. Oh, Owens like, should be a champion all the time. But what if he does? Right? I, I, was, I was sitting there watching the match. And I'm like, yeah, I know Roman, Roman Reigns wins. But maybe this is somehow going to change. Did you say and woman wins? Win. <laughs> you, you said woman wins wins. Yeah, woman wins wins. <laughs> woman wins. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I thought that maybe that at some point that would just change, and Kevin Owens would win somehow because that's how good. But that that, that match was that's how. us as wrestling fans saying Roman Reigns should lose this match and Kevin Owens should win. But that's Vince McMahon going, fuck you, and then shooting a fucking load of cum on our face. <laughs> that's, um, but that's I, also. Mario, that, you're, that you're, trying to be, to... I, you're trying to be diplomatic here. I get it. <laughs> We're not trying to be no, diplomatic. I mean, Vince McMahon no, shot I a fucking totally load of cum on our face going, nah, fuck you. Kevin Owens wins <laughs> this match. Well, yeah, I mean, well, hey, I mean, at the end of the day, you do whatever, whatever you know, do whatever I want, you know, so. No, man, but it pisses, I, pisses people off. That's that's part of the thing too. But that also goes back to the, that guy, like Kevin Owens and Daniel Bryan, where where they they make you believe that they're gonna win that match or that they can. Every and time. That's the whole point. Every time, as long as there's that inkling of what if, but what if he does? But what if he actually pins him? No, when, Daniel, if, when Daniel Bryan had Roman Reigns in the. Uh, uh, what's his yes lock? His movie? Yeah, yeah. Yes lock. And you're like, oh shit, he's actually gonna beat him. And then he didn't beat him, and you're like, oh man, like. But I was sitting there, and I, I hate Daniel you know, Bryan. I'm sorry, I'm not a big fan of. I, I actually like Roman Reigns better now when he's with Heyman, but he's Daniel phenomenal Bryan. as a heel, man. I'm sorry, oh, I think Roman Reigns heel. right now is just like I, yeah. I, I, I thought best he's, great he's ever been too. But... Yeah, the best he's ever been, definitely. Great. Yeah. That, now. When it comes to, like I said, with like the Fiend, the, the Randy Orton thing, I said it was not, there was never a payoff for me. I believe that right. there should always be a payoff. Not that it necessarily should make me happy because, you know, we know The Undertaker when Brock Lesnar beat him, everyone was like, what the fuck? Right. You know, but at least a payoff where it, it's, it ends the storyline and you know that there is a solid uh, conclusion. This was yeah, like yeah. Randy Orton, RKO'd him. That happens. Randy Orton is now going to be tag teaming with Riddle with no explanation of what happened with Bray. It, it just didn't flow, you know? I, yeah. That's very important to have that. I mean, I can't, yeah. The, I, I can't even begin to think of what, what they should do or what you could do, but I feel like sometimes it's like, that's where maybe you book yourself into like a corner, you know, and then it's like, well, how do, how do we get out of that one? You know, like we set him on fire, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> like, how do you bring him back? Like, but the other take, it was the same thing. Like my mind was already in disbelief where I'm like, you come like, you can float down from the ceiling. I'd believe it. You know, yeah, like yeah. at that point, nobody would care. Right. But it's like, just what are they going to do? So I think that's what like part of the um, pleasure they get out of the character is they do whatever they want with him. And yeah. him too, like he do whatever he wants, and it's anything. great, yep. anything. And when he lost, when he lost to Goldberg, it was similar. 
spear one, two, three, and you know, he was fine. We hate so Goldberg. Like, but that we hate Goldberg. He can stay down long, but I mean, like he can stay down long enough for three seconds. You only got to keep him down for three seconds. Yeah. You know, how many times have you seen him laid out? He'll get back up, but it's yeah. usually after three seconds. Yeah. You know, it's like you know, if I can I, hit something where he stays down for three seconds and get out of here, I win. I, I so think I think it, that's their that's yeah. their out. And, and their their mentality is he's so over that it doesn't matter. He can recover exactly. from it. He can exactly. recover from it. You know, just like I I think though the product now at WWE, like I said, I'm not really feeling it. I think the thing that saves them, and I don't know when they're going to do it, and they're sure going to pull the trigger and pay him a lot of money, is pulling Brock Lesnar back out. He'll be out. I think when Brock Lesnar's music hits, the pop is going to be crazy. And I'm not even a Brock Lesnar fan. I really can't stand them. But when he hits, like say it's against Roman Reigns, and Roman Reigns is just trashing everybody and being the dick, and Brock Lesnar's music hits, it's going to go ballistic. And it should yeah. because that's that's a spot. That's and that spot. was the that was a rivalry that for so long, and Roman mm-hmm. couldn't beat Brock. Yeah. Well, I guess like you know, if there's like you said a payoff at some point. You can continue stories with it, and hopefully things pay off, and people um, remember. <laughs> yeah, and people remember with stuff. But I mean, things like that. I think like like once we get they start getting more people back in, um, it's going to be. I think a little bit different with some stuff still, but I think people were expecting more, more surprises at mania and didn't come, yeah. you know, like more bigger returns of people and yeah. stuff. But, um, Even the role after mania was, yeah, we got not- Charlotte. Back. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. They didn't have fans. So I, you know, I feel like, and you know, I guess in the same sense, it's like, well, that's atmosphere is not going to be the same. One of yeah. the best. I, Raw I understand after- that, but, from what I, from what I, you know, was taken, I, I feel like it needed to feel more like the the, the Raw after Mania. One of the didn't. best Raw after Manias that I can remember is when Roman beat Undertaker, and then Roman came yeah. out, and he couldn't even lift the the mic to his mouth without them yeah. booing the shit out of yeah. him for like thirty minutes. Yeah, and right. then all he goes, "It's my yard now," and he drops the mic and he walks out. But Fucking that was like great. 20, 30 minutes of him, them just booing him. Nuclear heat. It was, at, yeah, it was, it was amazing too. I remember watching that just like cracking up. Like, dude, I'm like, every time he lifted that mic, I'm like, Jesus Christ, <laughs> this guy's going to be out here all day. Now, and, and at the same time, you being in that situation, Roman's got to figure like, wow, they hate me, but oh shit, this is it. I'm over. Like, all he had to say yeah. was what all he had to say, and that's why I'm like, I don't know, I didn't know if that was planned, you know what I mean? Like, if that was already what the spot was, or he just was like, fuck it, this is all I need to say. Yeah, but he could have stayed out there for another 10 minutes and they would have booed the shit out of him. Now, have you ever been in a situation like that in any of the federal, the, any of the promotions you've been in where like you come out to do a promo and either they're cheering you or booing you, where you just sat there for a minute with the mic and you just said something and the crowd just went nuts one way or another. Um, we didn't get to do a lot of in-ring promo stuff in general. Um, but there were times where I've worked in front of rowdy crowds and, uh, <laughs> usually it was oh, uh, more near like, uh, like Jersey city, Newark ish type oh, area. Oh, geez, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and some shows were in nightclubs and street fairs and there's a lot of alcohol and stuff involved, you know? So yeah, dude, I've seen some. Yeah, there's been some crowds there. People get hot quick, and we were like, we were doing in-ring live promos and stuff. But some of those were the best too. WrestlePro would do uh, shows in Edison Street Fair. Yeah, we love those Edison Street Fair shows. They're so great because the crowds. Uh, you can walk out and you you know just lock up and push the guy off, and the kids go nuts, and you're like, that's awesome. is it? Is you know, it, like, and you're like, what? You know, here we go. <laughs> Is it Here is it go. scripted stuff or you just go out and you say ad lib? Oh, now we're like you, buddy. I'm with you all, all match. I would pick one guy and I'm like right there. I'm like I'm gonna fuck with you all night. <laughs> you know, every time I do something good, it's like bam, that's for you, buddy. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I I've actually we've never actually asked this uh, to anybody else we've interviewed. Did you ever have any issues oh, with good. fans that came uh, that were either inappropriate, or tried to get into the ring? 
the worst fan that ever tried to get into the ring with me was my father. Really? really? I swear to God. <laughs> it was like, it was like my, well, my first match ever, <clears throat> not my first match, first year he came and, uh, tag match and you know, you're a rookie getting the shipping out of you. Of course, you're a rookie. And, uh, after the match, they're still beating us up. And when he comes down and he's like, what the fuck are you doing? Get off. And they were like, yo, they're like, calm down. My dad's ready to go. Oh, so then, of course, they push him back, you know, and he's like, you motherfucker. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, people are like, whoa. No. Like, here we go. And it was like, bam, everybody's on their feet now. Here we go. So it was oh, like, man. after that, I was like, you're not ready for this. You know, like, you're not, you're not, <laughs> you're not ready to come see this. I'll show but you. It took a long time before on. he came back. But yeah, when I was in Ace, he came to another show and like, <laughs> So he did it again where on some, it was a six man tag and they were fucking with my dad. And of course he was in the front row. So he was saying shit and it was, uh, he was getting all into it. So then we had the match and I brought him in the ring. Everybody was great. And we did another one where I told him we did a spot. I said, uh, we actually called it then in the ring. Cause I go, you guys hold me down. And then like, you go up, like you're going to splash me. And I said, it was a big, heavy dude, big guy. I said, the second you get to the top rope, I said, my dad's going to leave his seat and he's going to come to the ring. And they're like, get the fuck out of here. Are you serious? I'm like, I swear to God. I'm like, he's going to do a run-in right now. They go, did you tell him to do this? I said, no. I said, no, I didn't. I said, you can hit me once. You can hit me twice. But if you hit me three times with a belt, he's going to fuck you up. <laughs> they're like, all right. One, like, two. He goes up top. Here comes my dad right on top. Oh, shit. That's funny. The other guy partner. So my, he's distracted. He's distracted. He's distracted. The other guy comes in, he pushes the big guy off. <laughs> bam. Now we're back up and running and we fuck everybody up. And it was like, like how did you know? So I know my dad. <laughs> he going he gonna do running. He's gonna do running. But yeah, no, he was the worst one. Fans in general though, we really didn't have too many problems. I never really did. The worst crowds were always the alcohol crowds. Yeah. Alcohol crowds are rough. A lot of cursing. You can even you get called some bad stuff. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Now, I remember when uh, I, I talked to Vinny about this. When Daniel Bryan first retired uh, five, six years ago, whatever it was, you had posted a bunch of pictures of you and him together. What was your relationship with Daniel Bryan? Um, do you are you, do you still talk with him or like did you? I I know you fought with and against him, but did you ever like? Are you friendly with him? No, I mean we were. He was. Um, it was right after NXT where they did the. He re got released because of the necktie. Yeah. You know, incident with yeah. Um. So he was kind of making the rounds again or doing some stuff on the indies and. Um, Morgan had booked him. And we just kind of were like let's throw everybody together so we can all kind of work with each other. So we ended up doing like a four, a match with Christopher Daniels, myself, Danny Moff and Daniel Bryan. Vinny loves um, Christopher Daniels, by the way. He's all, he's so No, great. I'm yeah. kidding. Oh. He, he actually hates oh. him. <laughs> Do you really? He hates him? No, no, I don't, I don't, I don't know him obviously, but right. All right. No, no he's just not a fan. He's not a fan. Yeah. Uh, no, I like I actually like him as suicide because I don't have to look at him. But <laughs> just, <laughs> no, I mean he's not a bad wrestler. It's just the like the persona, I guess. I'm just not into it with the best. You didn't the like bad influence. Right? And... Yeah, yeah. It, it. I mean, he obviously is a legend in TNA. He's got a whole special dedicated to him on the, like I said, Pluto. It had yeah. Professor Christopher Daniels. He's a great wrestler. I just I just can't get into him. Yeah. Um, no, I, I mean, I was like, he's, I mean, he's been around so long too. Yeah. But he's just so good too. Like when he was in there though too, I mean, he's, he's been doing it for so long and he's so smooth and <clears throat> we just had so much fun, but Dan, he was too, whatever, whatever the business was of the match, because me and Moff were the main over the, or the title for the story. And we were like, we couldn't pin Brian because he's going back to WWE. Like that was part of like, he's not supposed to take a loss. So um, we were like, well, it doesn't make any sense if they, I would have lost, I didn't care. I was like, I'll take it then. And they're like, yeah, but that doesn't make sense because you're the contender for the title. So if you take a loss, you know, like we're trying to build you towards the title. And it's like, all right, well, 
So Daniel's ended up taking a roll up pin, I think, for Moff. So if Moff keeps the title or whatever it is, just easier for everybody. But they were just so easy to do whatever we needed to do, work with. We did promo stuff in the beginning and um, just putting things in the right spot. But he was so easy. And then afterwards, everybody went to uh, Applebee's and we were all at a table and he was literally, he's like ordered, just, I just take a, a big plate of vegetables. And we were like, just rant. I mean, for us, that's random. We're like, who the hell orders? I'll vegetables? take all the vegetables you have in the house. He just had a he just had a big plate of like grilled vegetables, and uh, that's when we were talking to him about that. He said because I was eating uh, a lot of meat, and I just didn't feel you know like my body was just I was always getting sick, and I felt nauseous, my stomach hurt, this and that. And he was kind of telling us all about it, and dude, he just shot the shit with us like no, he was cool as hell, like. Just hey, is there? Where was everybody going to eat? We're going to eat, you know. Like, we're like, yeah, we're going to go on this Friday. Okay, cool. Well, you know, I'll see you guys. There. Just came and hung out with us and ate. But and I, he was just a big, uh, you know. And then I was a big uh, fan. I mean, a big influence for me. Then when he was coming up, because you're like, for the indie guys, he was one of us. You know, like he was like our, he was our guy. Like we we're like, dude, like you know, like you're same height, same weight, same, you know. Like CM Punk is still a big dude. Like he's a tall dude. Like he's taller than most average people. Um, Dan Bryan's not. He's more along, you know, average size kind of person you see. But uh, yeah, we were always rooting for him. Yeah, it was like so. It was, a, and I just thought he was just such a a good the, that promo he gave too when he had to retire. Man, I was just like, oh yeah, it was great. Yeah, like nah, that's like just class. I'm like, a Daniel class. Bryan fan. I like Daniel Bryan. I know Vinny's like on the fence. No, I, 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 I'm not a fan of a lot of the characters that he's portrayed. I give him a lot of respect. I liked him probably best when, not even the Yes Movement, probably when he was first coming up, you know, in Nexus and stuff like that. And But um, I respect him. I believe that he has the traction because he's a smaller guy. He's the underdog. And I think it makes people actually believe and invest in him because of that and he makes people believe it and he you know he goes all out it's not yeah. that he's he's just a schlub like he's really you could tell he's like he's got welts all over his body oh he, yeah it, it, it's it's not even if you could see like you know when they say about wrestling dude he's getting his ass whipped and it's oh, sure yeah. <laughs> you know oh, yeah. oh, so yeah. that's why people invest in him more Vinny, put your hat back on because you look like fucking Cruel Deville with the fucking gray <laughs> and. But, listen, take your hat off, motherfucker. No, there's no hair <laughs> under my hat. That's why I don't take my fucking hat off. <laughs> you don't like that shit? No, it's... you look like a fucking Cruel Deville. You look my like gra- a... <laughs> my grays are hidden right now. <laughs> so, Mary, I gotta ask you. This is one. You know, everybody's gonna ask you who your your dream match was or 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 whatever. Who did you hate? wrestling against oh man i I know this is a tough one because everybody's you know you're always prepared for the my dream match or i love wrestling who did you hate wrestling against like wow just incredible said jbl like who did you hate getting in the ring with they were stiff they were they didn't sell whatever wow um i i i I read down your (laughs) roster you've wrestled Legends, Matt Cardona. <clears throat> oh, yeah, we, we hate him. I, he blocked. I, I, he blocked us both. Him, actually, I never. I never wrestled him. Um, Good. Chris Hawkins is next on our list to get blocked. By the way, and I know you're friends with him. <laughs> Why is he? He's next. Why is he next? Because he's fucking friends with Matt Cardona. <laughs> well, so is Mojo <laughs> Rawley, but Mojo Rawley is is pretty cool too. Mojo Rawley <laughs> likes everything we post when we shit talk about Mojo Rawley. <laughs> Guilty by association. <laughs> um, man, who did I hate to work? I mean, you know what? It wasn't maybe a particular person, but it was definitely a particular style of guy. Would definitely be uh, big, bigger, strong guys that have no idea how strong they are. Um, usually, that's when I'd get hurt or something would happen, or it was like definitely. Uh, I wasn't. I wasn't. I like working new guys and young guys, but when it's like. We were talking earlier about size is just a whole different ball game. Like you can do way less. Like you were saying how the smaller wrestlers you think have to work harder. Yeah. Uh, it's they have they in a way they, they do because they have to do different things. It's it's 
when you're six foot eight or six four, it doesn't matter how tall, and you're built 300 pounds and you're jacked. If you throw a clothesline, it's going to look way better than if I throw a clothesline. It's just yeah. common sense, <laughs> you know. So um, it's and easier gonna, to do less. And you're going to sell a clothesline way better than the guy who's fucking six eight, right? Yeah. So it's like so working. I just I I hated working with a a, a, a big a big green guy. As much as I have to say, big green guys, as much as I love them, and most of them are great, it's just, man. Then I always talk about it. I say, dude, I got to go to work tomorrow. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, everybody in general, we all have to, like, live outside of that six to eight minutes that we have. Right. You know? You think of all this preparation, all this sacrifice, and all these things that you do for, like, ten minutes. Yeah. Eight minutes. Sometimes it's four. You know what I mean? Like, and people right. that travel – all over the place, you know, but that's why, you know, you're getting compensated, you're getting paid. That's your job. Your job is to travel and then I, do some fun stuff for like 10 minutes. I have a question. I worked with a guy who was a uh, professional wrestler as well. So I'm wondering if you know him. He okay. wrestled under, under the moniker of One Warrior Nation. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. Oh, please tell yes, us. Yes, I do. Yes, please. Yes, I do. Um, Dominic Gianero. How well uh, do you know him? <laughs> I mean, no, no, he's not. He's not a. Uh, You're like watching this, right? No, now. No, 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 no. He, he's not. He's not a friend. I worked with him for like uh, two or three years, in you know, passing like, "Hey, how you doing? Hey, how you doing?" And then yeah. he was always like, "Oh, I'm one warrior nation." I'm like, "Dude, you're the ultimate warrior." He's like, "No, I'm not." I'm like, "Yeah, okay, yeah." yeah. And I, I know he got sued of- by the warrior too. I had met him, I would think it was working for Gino at the time still. It was kind of, I don't remember the exact time. I know it was in like Wayne, Cyberspace. I don't know. If, it's an old promote, a long time ago. Anyway, I met him first time working at ECPW show and super nice guy, took pictures with us all. He was all like super happy to meet me, really dressed up nice. I'm like, oh, you're cool. You're nice guy. He came, he was dressed, full gimmick music all right so we know what it is it's fine i'm like cool do it bro you know he comes flying down the ring dude no joke (laughs) calling ass around the corner comes back this way and i'm watching like an upper deck bleacher and it looked like somebody legit grabbed him and shit canned him right into the hardware right into the guardrail like face first (laughs) so i see him running 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 and then Bam, he dives right into the guardrail. And I'm like, and he gets up and he just keeps fucking running. And we're looking at each other like, did he just fucking fall? And I'm like, no sell it. And we're like, what the fuck? You know, like, I mean, needless to say, after that, we knew exactly what One Warrior Nation is all about. Yeah. And I still, I loved it because it was for me, you were like, hell yeah. You know, like we were marking out, you know, like we were like, I would do it. If you, if you gave me his paint and his stuff and the music oh, yeah. and Fuck go it. out there and do ultimate war, I'll fucking do it right now. Right. You know what I mean? Like and in front of people, hell yeah, I'd do it. And he, and he was so we were just, we loved it. Yeah. And he, and he was a champ for a while too. I remember watching some videos on YouTube and I'm like, I'm watching a match and it's just like, the same music, the same tassels everywhere, the same yep. face paint, the same duster. And I'm like, dude, he's like, no, he's like, and then he would tell stories, which I know aren't true. He's like, oh, I was on Raw. I was the second warrior. I'm like, that's not true. I was <laughs> like, there's no second warrior. But anyway, you know, he went with the whole thing. And there was actually uh, a radio interview with him. And then the warrior sued him. And then he actually won because... So Warrior never trademarked one Warrior Nation when he was in the mm-hmm. WCW. So, so yeah, no, no. yeah, which is crazy, crazy. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I've seen I've seen him do other shows and stuff, and then he didn't he didn't do it much after I first seen him to when yeah. he kind of stopped. I think he was making his way around certain places, and then it was uh, then you, you get in front of a certain crowd, dude, they would rip him apart. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure. They would rip him apart. I saw him <clears throat> just straight up heel. Like, he stopped doing Warrior. He was just like, <laughs> you know, like, that was it. He didn't, you know, he was like cursing, fuck it, fuck it, you know, like. So I would probably done the same thing at that point, but 
Yeah. People but, are they're ripping him apart for being an ultimate warrior. I mean, you not get, being the ultimate warrior. You get what you ask for, you know. I mean, what do you, you know? Do? That's the exactly. risk you take. <laughs> you exactly. Know? Yeah, exactly. If that's that's just they have the right to say whatever they want. And I think I think we were me and Ryan were talking about it. Um, I forget with who. If I came out, made my face all white, dressed in a in a suit, and call myself the grave digger, yeah, people would rip my ass apart too. Mm-hmm. You know? So hey, it is what it is. But hey, he he did what he wanted to do, and hey, I can't I can't blame him for that, you know. Yeah, I mean he was always really like I said, he was always super nice to everybody. Yeah, he was a real nice guy. He's just yeah. I, I will tell you one funny story about him at work real quick and i we called him a viking because <laughs> um he wasn't a tall guy either so no he, he was probably my height probably like five nine or something five yeah i think he was shorter than me too and i'm five nine so he was, yeah, yeah so and i know he wore like platform boots yeah. but um we're sitting there one day we used to order lunch from work and uh one day somebody came out from the back and they came up front and they're looking for the food and they're like hey you know we're missing my food and he's sitting there eating this fucking sandwich. And they're like, dude, you didn't even order. Is that my sandwich? He's like, I didn't see your name on it. They're like, it's not like it was in the refrigerator. <laughs> yeah. It literally just got delivered and you're eating my food. He's like, yeah, what are you going to do about it? I'm like, holy shit. I was like, he's wow. about to fucking, yeah, he's about wow. to do the fucking warrior slam on him through the table. But I was like, I'm out. But he wow, was just that's, just, that's just a dick. Yeah, but he, would, he, would, he, would, he, would through, he would go in the refrigerator. And just raid that shit like a Viking. <laughs> Straight up. I don't see your name on it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Claimed. Yeah. Yeah, he was a character, but. I, I've seen videos of him on YouTube, but Vinny's been telling me about this guy for, God, five, six years. Just, you know, being one warrior nation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He got out there, though. Yeah, man, that's wrestling. A whole bunch of... We're all crazy in some way. Everybody's out of their minds. Now, Mary, if you could get back in the ring right now, would you? Yeah. Yeah. If I could, yeah. I don't... <clears throat> I don't think I can. I mean, I'm, I, you know what? I think I could. The problem is it's like, again, the risk for reward. You know? Like, I would... I, I I did last, last year. I got in there and rolled a little bit and took a couple bumps, and I was like, "Feel good." Just saying, <laughs> you know, like the next day was okay. You know, I didn't seem to miss any steps either, so I was like, I just did warm up stuff. I didn't have a match or nothing, but I got in there, I warmed up like I normally would, practice bumps and rolls and things, and I was like, okay. But I also had a lot of vertigo going on too after that whole with well, the head issues and stuff, and <clears throat> so then too it was like other medications too so like it was just rolling is just not very good like when i go like a roll head over feet it's like whoa you know like i'll get up and it's just like super dizzy lightheaded like unstable <laughs> so if, if you could like teach though if you if you had an opportunity oh, yeah. to to you know like you know we said paul paul news and you know it's in uh dubai but if you mm-hmm. had an opportunity to, to be a teacher with all your experience all your history is that something you'd want to do or even referee? Oh yeah. I mean, honestly, I, cause I, I, I mean, I always wanted to try to, you know, wrestle until the wheels fall off. Everybody kind of says that. Um, but if the wheels fall off, then you can't drive at all. You know what I mean? Like, so I got to worry about life after wrestling. So, uh, I was always coaching and wanted to coach and with the PC performance center out and, I was always, and they're bringing in guest coaches. So that was always kind of like a goal and working toward that. And then pandemic hit again. I moved to Tampa, you know, so I'm, I'm actually in Florida now. Performance Center is in Orlando. Like, you know, we're close by. Hope, so hopefully someday pandemic hits, life changes again. You, you, know, know? you, you keep saying <clears throat> like, you know, one day we're 40. We're all 40. You're, you oh, just no, turn, yeah. You just, just turned 40. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to be 40 next week. Vinny's 40 in a couple of months. This is the time. Do it. Yeah. Oh, I said, dude, I would, uh, I would, yeah, I would coach in a heartbeat. If anywhere, anywhere I could, that would, um, dude, I'd love to open up my own school, but right. It's just financially impossible. Not at this moment in time, it is, but it's, 
I would like to get there. So I'm, I'm spent gonna... a lot of time working on a lot of other stuff. And I, and, um, when I was wrestling, it was all I cared about was wrestling and everything went towards it. Money went towards it, new gear, boots, um, food, supplements, whatever it was, everything went towards it. And it's like, I ne neglected so much stuff that I needed to take care of, including myself and my body. Um, that it's like, I'm doing that now and I'm getting, I'm getting comfortable with it and I'm getting there, you know? So I got my own place. I'm in, you know, got my own apartment, I have my own car, I have a job, I'm doing my own thing, you know? And it's only been, I've only been in this apartment like six months. So right now I'm like, I'm excited for the future. I'm just, and now the future is just getting there. And that's why right now I just try to keep, um, stay in the best shape I can. And I would referee tomorrow. I would, I would coach tomorrow. I would do it all. It's just a matter of <clears throat> probably part of me too, is just, um, a little social anxiety or self-consciousness and things like that. I'm not comfortable around larger groups and people and trying to uh, have you ever met me mario i'm i'm not it, either it, it, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's crazy because just incredible actually said the same thing yeah to a, yeah to and here's the thing mario like you know we've known each other 40 years i've known Vinny <laughs> 35 years you know um we had we've it, because of this show with the people that we've interviewed and, and the connections we've made if you want to do coaching or whatever, I'll make, uh, I'll make calls for you. Like, you know, you're a kid three blocks away from me. If you want to be a coach, I'll call Gary Michael Capetta. He lives in Jackson. I'll call just incredible. He, yeah, fuck, he drunkenly gave <laughs> us our, num his number. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Yeah, we, got about his, that. He, we got his number in our phone. Yeah. We oh, have yeah. his number in our phone because he drunkenly called us with his phone number. Um, <laughs> PN News just started a wrestling school in Dubai. Mosh from uh, uh, Headbangers lives right by you, and he he's a professional yeah. kickball player. Like, yeah, and just opened, just opened up his uh, his new uh, merch store too. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. Where so I mean, like, Mario, you're a kid from my neighborhood. If you want help and you want to get back in the wrestling, the two of us, Bergen County boys, will yeah. help you. Yeah, I mean, I'm. I said I've been going to shows. This past WrestleMania was like most I've been to because of last year. Um, and everybody uh, keeps saying too, there's there might be something a uh, coaching opportunity near Sarasota, um, but I'm not going to see how that plans out first. I, I would, like I said, coaching was always my main. Like, I always knew I could go back to, to doing that, you know, because like obviously you can't wrestle forever. I thought I could wrestle a little bit longer, but who knows? But you see guys like Edge too now, and you're like, dude, not anything's possible. Sean yeah. Michaels took four, four years off and came yeah. back, you're and all that was extra. Like, you're a kid so from I'm my just... neighborhood. I want to see <laughs> you succeed, and I so, want to. And that's you... the thing too. I want to do that too. To I say it's more for uh, for you know other people that you know like believe in me and stuff and family and everybody. I'm like, like I guess I want to keep trying and going and doing something. And I know I know I can a lot of. A lot of the concussion stuff really, really set me back. Um, not using it as an excuse because, you know, everybody's got a choice. We all make our own decisions. Um, but it was for a while, like, I've seen so many chronicles and 24 on the network and all these, like, you hear about Big E going through things and, you know, like Sasha Banks going through things where, they're contemplating themselves in life. And there's so many things like, and it's different when somebody who's on a main scale, like we were saying, goes through that stuff. Like people understand and they get it. Like when you're on, when you're not a superstar, people don't get it or really acknowledge it as much. Like we were saying, Oh, they're like, Oh, you just quit. You know, like whatever you quit. It's like, you know, you don't get it. Like there's a lot of things that go into it. So at all these chronicles and videos, and I see all these things that everybody's, talking about and losing wrestling and wrestling left them i'm like dude it can be over tomorrow and it's happened to me multiple times and each time i was lucky enough to just get it back for a little while but i don't know about this time but but there's something else that i belong in the wrestling business somewhere and i haven't invested that much time and knowledge and have all these things and do that for nothing right i always explain to everybody that li lately it was like it was like getting a divorce from a 20 year. Most marriages don't last longer than 20 years. Right. 
Vinny. So wrestling was like getting divorced. <laughs> I, well, I'm just saying, <laughs> you know, and it was like, for me, it was the same for me. It was like, I still loved her, but I got to let her go. Yeah. So I had no choice in trying to figure that out too. Like that's rough, man. Dude, that's rough when that's all you've known yeah. since you were like until 39. 38 ish you know like that this is rough so it was hard transitional period so i feel like i'm over the up climb and now i'm looking down on everything else so it's like well look as you're looking down on everything else and this is a question i've never asked anybody because i've never cared enough to ask okay. this to anybody and like i said just incredible pn news you know you Looking at the landscape of wrestling today, who do you want to wrestle? Ooh, looking at now, man. Every every um, promotion, and there's is there just one person you're like, oh, I could fuck that guy up. Because like I'll compare <laughs> you to like a Kurt Angle because you're a submission guy. Yeah, but you can wrestle. But like, who's the guy you're like, oh, fuck that guy up? Oh man, who do I really want to get in there with recently? Um. Man, it's been hard because I haven't thought like that in such a long time of like opponents and man. Are you gonna go in there? And... I was like, I say Cody, but I said I, I wrestled. I got to wrestle Cody, so that was awesome. Are you gonna that go in there crazy. and beat fucking Kenny Omega, please? Somebody, can you go in there and <laughs> beat fucking Ken... beat Kenny Omega just for the fucking <laughs> sake of us hating Kenny Omega? <laughs> just go in there, yeah. please, Mario. I'm begging you, beat Kenny Omega. I would, I would wrestle Kenny Omega in a heartbeat. Um, Again. one of my all times was AJ Styles, and he got signed like you know, like to WWE, right? When I, he was kind of making his he came to PWS a little bit, and it was like that. He was always like one of my guys that I wanted to get in there with, and that never happened. Um, he's a good possibility of if I had one, it would be AJ Styles, I think. Hey. I, you with AJ, you know, size wise comparable. He's a little bit more of a high flyer technical. I think it'd be a good comparison to be a different type of match. You know, yeah, I think you yeah, had suplexes to, you know, more technical ground based yeah. kind of, you know, aggressive, strong style ish to, yeah. uh, to transfer. Yeah, I feel like it, I just feel like it's so many different, especially when you know somebody's arsenal, you're like, I can counter this. We can counter that. Like we can yep. do that. One guy I did really, I don't know if you even knew I got to work, um, who I would work with every day if I could. One is also called Cabana because he's just awesome and so easy, but orange Cassidy, dude, if I could wrestle him any day of the week, every day, I would wrestle him forever. Would because you just fucking put awesome. him in a submission with his stupid hands in his stupid fucking pockets just fucking Scott, uh, duct tape his hands into his fucking Yeah, pocket. just fucking duct tape his hands in his pockets and put him in the fucking arm bar and just fucking choke that motherfucker out. I don't even hate him. Just fucking choke him out. <laughs> That's funny, yeah. he's so, It's so easy to have a match with him. So easy. Physically. <laughs> physically on your body. <laughs> he... He's t I'm 6'3", 250. You're 5'9". Vinny's 5'7", whatever. He's like... Five two and a hundred <laughs> pounds. I don't even know what he is. Just fucking German suplex him, put him in your arm bar, and just fucking kill him. Just call it a day. Yeah. Well, that was funny because that's kind of what people are like. I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I can take any bumps. People are like, you don't got a bump, bro. We'll put you over. <laughs> we were like, I'll do it. I'll do it for you. No problem. You I don't you know, you got bump it all. Some yeah. has it. Real quick, how do you feel about Joey Janela? Because we talked to another wrestler. <laughs> who did not like him whatsoever because he grew yeah. up. Well, his mother-in-law was related to him, right? Or something like that? Something like oh. yeah. Just incredible. His mother-in-law is like Joey, Joey Janela's Janela is from neighbor. Jersey. He's from... Right. I was going to yeah. say, I know Joey. Yeah, yeah I know has Joey it. very well. Yeah. He said that Joey Janela used to come over all the time to his mother-in-law's house and, like, talk all this shit and, like, ask him for advice. And then he got to where he's at now and Justin Critter was like oh you want to do something he's like nah <laughs> and he like just fucking like blew him off yeah yeah I knew I knew him from Jersey I they uh, I, I met Joey I think it was NWS 
Johnny Dapper used to run shows in Jersey, like Bergenfield Elks and around local Bergen County stuff. Yeah. And that was where I met Joey. I guess he would, he was working with them and he would set up the ring and help them out or do whatever and train. And uh, first time I met him, he just acted like I, we, you know, we, we were longtime friends and uh, he was always, he was always Joey. Like just, he was always just out there. He had, he was very opinionated on, you know, and he, tried to do whatever he could do um i love joey to death joey's joey's um a character uh, i guess maybe you could say like part of the the allure of him is like he's a mild train wreck i guess <laughs> um, oh, no. i hate to, i hate to say that like i'm not putting i hope i'm not putting him down I'm not but i mean like he's not gonna joey's listen just, just like, say whatever that you want <laughs> man dude he got like such a he, he he lives his gimmick, man. He is him. And Mario, talk shit. He's I know not a lot of people to this. that want to knock him the fuck out. I'm telling you that. Fuck much. Joe's a, lot that <laughs> um, a lot of people that would, but um, he's another guy too. It's like he just made it off of social media. Like he used social media a lot, and I, a lot of people have. Uh, I think even Jim Cornette was like, um, he, he doesn't have. He's he's not the greatest wrestler in the world and he doesn't have a built body and he doesn't um fit the mold but fans like him yeah and i'm 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 guilty too of enjoying his matches so if i i gotta ask you i know we talked about you know who would you want to wrestle who right now is your favorite right like you could say you watch a match and you're like i have to watch this guy wrestling he, right. It, it's no doubt about it. Like I'm watching him, no matter what he's doing. That's the guy. Is it? A, is right. it Omega? Is it? Is it uh, Bray Wyatt? It, Seth Rollins? You know. Um. Honestly, man, for me, like right now, I, I, I really think Roman Reigns is like. I don't think anybody's. Maybe Bobby Lashley, but either one of them, I they're really both clicking on all cylinders, like. Randy Orton always clicks anyway, no matter what he does. So oh, Vinny sick. hates Randy Orton. You hate him? <laughs> I just like he's just very technical. I mean, when he does yeah. stuff, like he's so good. But um, I mean, you're you're seeing you're you also see it from the opposite side of where I'm seeing it. You know, you yeah. see the craft version. Yeah, I see just the theatrics. You know, yeah. So, um, theatric wise too, though. Like you're saying, okay. Um, I mean, like, even in AEW, um, like, the act, like, it's just weird because it's, like, so random, I guess. But, like, um, Abaddon, that girl. Like, I like yeah. those You know, like, I just – that – Britt Baker's doing awesome, too. Britt Baker's awesome. Yeah, awesome. Under Rosa. That, that and her music and her, her promos and her talking and her finisher, like, Dude, I've been listening to her entrance music, and I'm like, she's badass. Like, it's just bad. It's, it's good. Like, when someone's got all clicks and you're checking them, and music, too. Like, there's some John Moxley music fits in perfectly. There's just, like, they get the musics on a lot of them. Hangman, Adam, Bay, awesome. Like, musics that fit. That, that's like, how I felt about Seth Rollins when he had the Burn It Down music. Yeah. And now when he's the Monday Night Messiah in that, I'm like, ugh. Like, I love <laughs> Seth Rollins. I was like... I, he was my favorite part of the shield. Yeah. And when he became, you know, the whiny bad guy for uh, Sting, and, and you know, he almost killed Sting. But um, you know, that whole run and just every part of Seth Rollins was like, this is the new guy. This is the guy. Yeah. And then they converted him from Burn It Down to the Monday Night Messiah. I'm like, well, you just killed his buzz. Just that was, I was gonna say, well, that's they just took it away. Everything, everything that you did to cheer him, you yep. gotta take away. Yep. Like Nakamura, they changed when they. Yeah, same thing. Oh, yeah. He was another one. Music, bro. When he came yep. in, I was like, dude. Yep. Everyone like, was like humming, singing. What a home run, you know? Yeah. Like, awesome. And then got they to Mania him. and didn't do it. To heel and that was it. And, you know? And, and I know he was actually successful in Japan as a heel. But yeah. when he got here in NXT and WWE, my, like I said, my son at that time was two. When his music yeah. would come on, he was like hyped up. He came out to, yeah. I think it was Royal Rumble, and Corbin attacked him. My son started crying, screaming well, that he's going to attack. When, when AJ fought Nakamura, 
everybody thought it was going to be the classic. And it was low blows. New, yeah, low the blows. classic New Japan AJ versus Nakamura. That was like three or four classic, undeniably amazing matches. And then they do it in WWE. It's like low blow, low blow. Oh, <laughs> elbow off the rope. And oh, it depends. But they've taken everybody from there. Like you take, you know, the Good Brothers now, but Anderson and Gallows, who are so successful on NJPW, and you put them in WWE and you kill them. Then you tease the Balor Club, who never had anybody, which you thought they were going to be incorporated. Ba- to. Yeah, but he started the Bullet Club, and I hate the yeah. Bullet Club. I'm sorry, I hate the Bullet Club because I know they got permission from Kevin Nash and Scott Hall to do the fucking two sweet shit, but come on. Come up with your own fucking gimmick. You're the Bullet Club. It's a new thing. Don't steal this shit. Like, you know, (laughs) you're you're your own thing. Yeah, I understand. Because I was always... The club itself can be fine, but like you were saying, doing the same... Yeah, too sweet. And saying, it's like, yeah, and you know, the whole thing the same way, it's like... You're doing, oh, it's too sweet. It's for life. It's like, now, the generation after us... Had no idea who NWO was. Exactly. They're right. not going to know who, like, if it wasn't for the fact that the NWO just got inducted to the Hall of Fame, which is yeah, another well, thing. I guess that's, yeah. I, I said this to Vinny a couple weeks ago. Hogan's a two time Hall of Famer. You know who else is a two time Hall of Famer? X Pac. Sh- Sean Waltman. <laughs> They're both huh? two time Hall of Famers. That's not right. But. <laughs> And he might be a third-time Hall of Famer, If too, he ever gets well. on his own, he'll be three-time Hall of Famer, which is more wow. than Hogan. Wow. But, like, yeah. doing all this shit, like, dude, come up with your own shit. Nobody's going to know the NWA. And I hated the NWA. I don't know about you, Mario, but, like, I was I like a him. WWE guy who fucked oh, yeah, the WCW. Yep. Like, it was like Monday. It was like commercial. Let me see what WCW is doing. Yeah. Back to WWE. I, uh, I was a WCW guy, but I was, like, Raven's Flock. WCW guy, like I was into you know we know we were all sort of grunge. They're different, yeah. I was yeah I liked them. Um, I was I was always a WWE guy, and then I would watch during commercial. But then too, they Nitro did a replay at like a, one a.m. or something like yeah, that. Yeah, something yeah. like Every that. Day. Crazy, yeah. So I just didn't get much sleep Monday night. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that was kind of how it went. And, and so. I, I always tell the story, it's like, you know, and then ECW comes along. And I remember my brother waking me up at like four o'clock in the morning to turn on MSG Network yeah, to watch, you know, Raven versus Hack or Sam, man, whatever the fuck it's yeah. called. I hate that guy. Um, <laughs> Guy's getting murdered. Yeah. <laughs> and it was Jack, like, holy Jack shit. Killing, yeah. And we we went, got killing people with Nintendos. Yeah. And me and Vinny went, and Sean, my brother, went to Living Dangerously 98 in Asbury Park. Oh, wow. And it was like, holy shit, ECW is the shit. And now I gotta watch WWE. Yeah, I never got to go to a real one. It, it was it was it changed the whole idea of wrestling completely. Oh yeah. And we saw that and we were like we, we talked to Justin Credible about it and they keep having all these people are inducted in the WWE Hall of Fame. We're waiting for the we're inducting the whole ECW roster into the right. whole because they revolutionized the way everything and was yeah, done. They changed the game. Yeah, it's crazy. One but day I want to see Mario Bacara Bocara's name on the WWE Hall of Fame roster. Oh, me too. I want to me see too. that. My kid, the kid from my neighborhood, TNA superstar. I'm going to say that. TNA superstar, multiple time champion, multiple time tag team champion, wrestled against legends. You should be in, you should be in that conversation, at least Impact Hall of Fame. I appreciate that. Thank you, man. It means a lot. Like I said, I, it's crazy to think I don't. Where I, I always look at the, the things that I didn't get, like you were saying, you put things into perspective, man. It's like. All right, you know what? I think, I think I'm okay with that. <laughs> like I yeah, said, I mean, you you think about you know people's lives in general. We've all done things in our lives that are are awesome and cool in our own aspect. You can say like 
I was a WWE wrestler. I was an impact wrestler from being a kid in New Milford and reaching that and, and, and being in the ring with all these people and, and being able to wrestle in front of thousands, tens of thousands of people is fucking incredible. And a lot of people won't ever have that experience. And I think that's, that's yeah. so cool. Thanks, man. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, like I said, I, at the end of the day, I, I lived, I guess I lived my dream because that was the dream. Anyway, the dream was just, be, if you would have told 12 year old me that you would have done all that and by 40, you'll be living in Tampa, Florida. It's a, it's an older style, but I, I have a Mustang. I always wanted to have a Mustang. <laughs> 2010. And I'm never going to see fucking snow here. <laughs> That's the best. So I'm best driving part of a rear wheel drive vehicle. I think 12 year old <laughs> you was that bad at Little League while I was the catcher behind you talking shit to you, going, fuck you, you're never going to hit this pitch. And then you <laughs> fast forward X amount of years and you're fucking fighting on. You know, impact, I remember, and, and, yeah. I, and me and Vinny are doing our podcast interviewing you. <laughs> so I think you won Crazy. this one. Yeah, yeah, you won. You won. <laughs> yeah, you got that. I, I think the, me being the right. catcher talking shit to you as the batter in Little League, you won this one. Uh, yeah, I said I think the twelve year old me would be think think you're pretty cool. So I'm like, <laughs> all right, you know, he'd probably be like, all right, you'd be cool. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, please. That's not a bad day. Tell us where we can find you on social media. Um, I, I, I want to make sure that this is not the last time you get to talk wrestling or you get to be involved with wrestling. Like I said, and I'm, I'm going to stress this a million times, you're a kid from my neighborhood. We're Bergen County boys. Yep. We, we're, yeah, we yeah. support each other. Yeah, man. You know, if, if we can help you, yep. I'd love to do that. Please tell us where we can find you on social media. Uh, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter. I don't like just, be, <laughs> it's just, I'm <laughs> not, not it really, but, uh, honestly, everything I'm, I have is just under Mario, uh, underscore Bocara. So if you, any form of social media, if you type in my name, search, it's coming right up. Nice. So, we Mario like underscore Bocara, Instagram and Facebook. We like Twitter, but we get blocked by a lot of wrestlers on Twitter. I have it. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure you do. We got blocked um, by Matt Cardona because we said he sucked less than less Mojo than Raleigh. Mojo Raleigh. <laughs> and Mojo Raleigh, Mojo Raleigh liked that tweet, and then Mark yes. Matt Cardona said to Vinny, "Brush your teeth." Profile picture. Brush your teeth, and then blocked him. And then I said, "Why would you tell him to brush your teeth?" And then he blocked me. So. And then I talked shit about him and said, oh, you're a big fucking man. Uh, you're going to block me without giving me a chance to respond. You suck. Uh, while you're not winning any matches, I was in Iraq fighting a war. So, uh, you know, it, we, it just got nasty. Yeah. Got but, nasty, uh, yeah. yeah. But Mojo I, Raleigh, I, I have just, a newfound respect yeah, Mojo, for Mojo Raleigh because he we, likes we, everything we post yeah, about yeah. him. We trashed Mojo Raleigh. And it wasn't, like, malicious. It was just, like, a joke. Yeah. And – we were going on like we sent. He said he said something, and we t tweeted like he, about him being fired. And we were like, "Oh, this is Mojo Rawley in 2022." And it was like a picture of a guy acting all crazy. And it was like 2023, and it was like a homeless guy. And it was like 2024, and it was like another homeless guy that was. And, and then he liked head. all of them, and, and he the, liked all of them. And we're like, yeah. "Dude, you're the best." And then I yeah. posted yeah. something like, "And I I love that you liked that." everything we posted i still don't give a shit you got fired and he liked that one <laughs> and it was just it was just the fact that he didn't take himself seriously exactly i was gonna sort of say yeah. you come after yourself and, and he was so awesome about it and then matt cardona the minute you said i well like i said to him i because mojo talked about going to school and having student debt so i was like oh you got a phd in being more boring than matt cardona <laughs> and he blocked me right away. I'm like, dude, I actually complimented you because you weren't as bad as Mojo Raleigh. But, you know, whatever. <laughs> we, Matt yeah. Mara, we talk a lot of shit about a lot of wrestlers on this show. Oh, man, it's all good. Arn Anderson is one of the, one, the, one of the top ones we hate. <laughs> Lanny Poffo. Lanny Poffo. Really? Do you remember? Okay, actually. The Beverly Brothers. I can't believe we have – we've been talking now uh, – 
two and a half hours. Yeah. Do you I remember? know. I was gonna say, I'm like, we got it. We got to get ready to go soon. So yeah, yeah, we're yeah, gonna yeah. we're gonna wrap this up, but I have to I ask you one question. Months. Do yeah. you remember Jim Powers? Of course. From Carlstadt, East Rutherford area. Wrestler Jim Powers. Yes. 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 He's yeah. from. Do you remember? Yeah. Oh in, yeah, I've seen him. Yeah. So there's uh, Metro Liquor in East Rutherford. So six months ago, I started this show. And about three episodes in, Vinny made a remark about Jim Powers. No, you made a remark about or, Jim Powers. I, I may have a oh, remark about Jim Powers. Is. And Vinny, who's from Carlstadt, made a remark about the fact that Metro Liquor in Rutherford on Hackett's or Hoboken Ave. Whatever, Patterson ha- Ave. Patterson Ave. Patterson Ave. You know, where the main road that goes from like through 17 to Wallington. <clears throat> Vinny used to work at the Super Video that was there. And there was Metro Liquors right there. And there was a headshot of Jim Powers signed. And we theorized for about an hour about how the picture got there. <laughs> we, con- we, we got in touch with Jim Powers. We wanted to have him on this show. We talked about him for weeks. For weeks we talked about him. He wanted $100 to the interview. He didn't have a cell phone except a flip phone. I would have to pay him cash, and he wanted to come to my house to do the interview. Yeah. And he was at Metro Liquors three times a day. Well, yeah, looks like you got your answer, I guess. Yeah. I talked to him on the phone, and, he, and you know, he's like real rather than like, oh, is this Ray? And I'm like, no, it's Ryan. Oh, been hitting the head a lot of times. So, you know, we we always talk about the Jersey wrestlers. You're in the company, and I don't mean this as an insult by any stretch. You're in the same company as Jim Powers. (laughs) Jersey wrestlers. He's he's a lot better than Jim Powers. No, Mary, you're a hundred times better than Jim Powers, but (laughs) Jim Powers did fight Ric Flair and lost. But you know what? We're going to... Right now, actually, let Mario go. We have been doing this for two yes. hours and forty five. I know. I was like, I know. Mario, I, I can do that. Sorry, for that. Do, I, knew, I was like, yeah, it's going happen. I'm sorry, Mario. It's, it's been so awesome. I'm finally glad we no, man. Hell absolutely, yeah. absolutely have you on here. It's so Thank fucking Thank you so much cool. for having for coming yeah, on. Yeah, you know, I'll do. Um, I would love to do. Like, I don't know if you guys do watch alongs. Well, now there's no networks, so we no, we do. Shit. That's our whole show is watch alongs. <laughs> All right, the whole show is normal. I'm always watchable. down to yeah. I'm always down to watch. I love watching. Usually, I, I spoil shit, but no, I'll listen. call stuff when it's due. <laughs> like I'll be like, he's gonna kick out, and he kicks out. People look at me. No, we we do the same thing. We're like, oh, this is gonna happen. This is gonna happen. This is gonna. Yeah. Be. Listen, From watching so long, it's just like okay. Yeah. Sometimes you get. So, yeah, I'd love to watch some. Listen, yeah. when we're not interviewing, our whole show is watch alongs, but we find the worst pay per views to watch. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. I said, let me know. I'll definitely come in for one. <laughs> now, let me ask you a question. Are you on any Impact uh, pay-per-views that we could watch along? Uh, pay-per-views? No. No, we didn't do actual pay-per-views. We did... They did, like, those one-night-onlys. Oh, which was like... you're on a one-night-only? Yeah. They're on Impact Plus. I'm going to find one. <laughs> and we're going to do a watch-along with one with you on it. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> I don't like watching my stuff. No, you don't have to. We'll watch. It. Uh, okay. No. Okay. Good. Good. Mary, Once thank again, you so much. You yeah. No, no. Thanks, man. I'm glad we finally got to sit down and do it. We were Absolutely. Talking about it for a while. We are on this Twitter. My, I'm sorry. Go ahead, man. One of my favorite interviews so far because you're a Bergen County guy, and the you know the New Jersey circle is very small. We got yeah. to talk about shit. Other than wrestling, <laughs> that we all can relate to. I appreciate that. Yeah, great. man. Awesome. Thank you, dude. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, Have man. We're time. we're on Twitter at Front Face Lock, Instagram at Facebook, uh, Twitter at Front Face Lock, Instagram and Facebook at Front Face Lock Podcast, Anchor.fm, Front Face Lock Podcast. Anywhere you can find a podcast, uh, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcast, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audible. Please donate. We'd like to have Mario back a million times. We're going to find something you were on, and we are going to totally <laughs> watch that. Oh, no. 
Mario, thank you so much. Mario Vicara, Bokara, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. We'll see you back Thanks, in the guys. neighborhood in New Milford. <laughs> yeah, man. I'll let you know when I'm coming by. All right. All right. Take it easy. Thanks. Have a good man. night, everybody. You too. Bye.